Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Payments Conference of Sigma 2018, sponsored by BitBay Pay, chaired by Patrick Kadletz. Welcome, guys. Uh, I, I hope that you have a good good night. And right now we have uh, great present presentations. Uh, so uh, I'm CEO of uh, BitBay Pay. So it's a um, eco ecosystem payment gateway uh, for uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. But we also do the fiat uh, fiat uh, uh, transactions. So uh, being here, uh, we want to. We want to get into in <coughs> iGaming I, I gaming, uh, market. So uh, we have great speakers today. Uh, and I want to uh, tell you about how, how the money uh, evolved for, for the years. Yeah? So uh, as a community, we have uh, 3,000 years of uh, uh, dealing with the, with the money. Yeah? So uh, first, we were bartering with, uh, with uh, uh, vegetables, grains, and the life, life, uh, life tax. Uh, then we de uh, developed a coin. It was uh, 600 years before cr crisis, crisis, crisis. Then, in 1660, we have a, a first uh, uh, bank, banknotes. And uh, in uh, 19... 46, we have the first uh, credit card issued. So right now we have uh, uh, times of uh, digital money, and all the uh, the, the uh, this uh, conference is about the future, uh, where we had it had it with the uh, with the digital money, and especially in uh, i gaming industry. So uh, I'm very honored to uh, host this, uh, this uh, uh, conference for the payments. So I wish you a great, great day, and uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be there for, with the presentations and, and uh, panels. Thank you very much, and uh, my, my uh, next speaker will be there. See you. AML, social responsibility. Improve your game against money laundering. Verify sources of funds and wealth and identify problem gambling challenges while protecting players against financial crime. Ray Wilson, AMLGS. Lionel O'Hara, AMLGS. Good morning, everyone. A big well done to all of you guys for waking up early. I'm sure we saw some of you had quite late nights, so well done for getting here early. My name is Ray Wilson. I am here on behalf of AMLGS. AMLGS delivers bespoke in-house financial crime training and problem gambling services <coughs> for the industry in the UK and across Europe. We're made up of a number of experts from the law enforcement arena, from financial crime itself within gambling and within other industries and other sectors. We also have clinical specialists embedded in our services. So we're able to deliver our, our training from a multi-layered perspective. In addition, I myself am an accredited financial crime investigator, an accredited Crown to Ford, and an anti-money laundering specialist. That's a tongue twister. Um, so yes, today we'll focus on uh, the AML, problem gambling, whether you call it problem gambling, whether you call it social responsibility, or you call it responsible gaming. Okay, so one of the reasons why we're here today is because not only have we got experts who have worked in the, in the arena, we've also got experts who have actually laundered, have worked in covert investigation roles for UK law enforcement, infiltrating organized crime groups, 
to understand the trends and techniques they use to launder the proceeds of crime, the ways they try to perpetrate financial crime in the industry. In fact, some of our consultants, myself included, included have actually laundered the proceeds of crime for these organized crime groups in gambling establishments, both online and land-based. Okay, so, it's clear now, really. It is really clear that the deregulators are not playing games. This light-touch approach that we had a few years ago is no longer the way. Even today, if you've seen the UKGC's website, there's been announcements about further regulatory action. If we've seen the action you know, since, since January 2017, we've had 18 uh, regulatory act, uh, fines for operators in the U in UK and in, in Malta, uh, the restrictions for failings around AML and prominent gambling. And the reason why these failings are being quite harsh is because I believe a lot of these failings were easily identifiable and easily preventable if the correct measures were taken. But I won't focus on the negatives. I will focus on the positives and how we can move forward. I think we've been butchered and badgered with all the negatives and all the failings as an industry. So today my focus will be about the positives and how we can move forward to get things right as an industry. Uh, first and foremost, there are a lot of positives, a lot of um, operators who are doing the right thing. Like I said, you guys are here. First thing, bright and early this morning, which shows there's an interest. There's an interest for people to know how they can improve their, 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 their business. We engage with more and more operators, so that shows that there's a real key interest in how, as an industry, we can move forward, we can improve. But we can't sit here and, and sweep things under the carpet. I can't stand here and lie to you any longer. Public confidence in the industry, in the industry is at an all-time low. And that's because we have, as an industry, been failing our customers around problem gambling, around AML. So what I'll do is I'm not gonna, I'm gonna kind of just cover a few things and areas where it has been going wrong, and then move on to how we can put a few steps in place to make sure we go, it goes right. Because there, there is time, there is, there is time to, to, to kind of get things right. There is time to regain that public confidence to build your, rebuild your brand if you've, if you've had you know, some uh, reputational damage, so to speak. And if we kind of focus now compliance, uh, the mindset of not a limitation of our business, but what we can actually do within a framework to achieve commercial success, then we're gonna stand in a good position to go forward and thrive as an industry. So quickly, I'm gonna list three main common areas where it's kind of been overtly going wrong. The first area for you guys to jot down and know if you, if you feel like you need to is lack of knowledge around source of funds and source of wealth. When we go into operators, when we see the regulatory action, it's quite patently obvious that a number of compliance staff, a number of individuals, key individuals in businesses don't actually know what source of funds are or don't actually know the difference between source of funds and source of wealth. We have some people uh, in compliance teams, in due diligence, due diligence teams, uh, you know, saying, okay, someone's source of funds are legitimate because it's come from a bank. That's a remittance. That doesn't assure that somebody's source of funds is legitimate. So to, we have to go and change our, our approach and really assure that somebody's funds are legitimate or, in any case, possibly illegitimate. It's vitally important that all staff in the business understand the nuances between source of funds and source of wealth. Just because somebody is worth 10 million, if they'd come to the business to try to transact for 100,000, it doesn't mean that that 100,000 is legitimate because they're worth 10 million. Okay, you must, be, you must assure yourself that though that specific transaction, okay, is a legitimate transaction. The next key area, probably the area which I'm best uh, knowledgeable in is kind of the lack of knowledge around adequate completion and adequate submission and the SAR process. So when I say SAR, that's suspicious activity reports for those who don't know, or suspicious transaction reports depending on, on your restriction. Again, we've seen examples where we've gone into operators and more glaringly where the action has shown where staff don't actually know how to report an internal SAR process or further still, the MLRO doesn't know how to report a SAR onto the relevant body. Not just 
having, knowing how to report, it's also been a real lack of knowledge around the content, what to include, what's valuable for those agencies you're actually reporting to, what kind of information do they need. Okay, another big problem has been how to manage, for those in the UK, the consent or what's called now the DAMO process, the Defence Against Money Laundering. Okay, we're having a lot of operators who don't understand the process or if they're if they asking for consent are still transacting within the time, within the notice, notice period. They might not even know what the notice period is. So once you've asked for consent, you must wait for consent to, to consent is granted before you do transact with that customer. The next failing, okay, and it's probably the one that's most prevalent at the moment, is the failing to identify signs of problem gambling and act within adequate time frames. Okay, again, we've seen examples from operators when we do train, we do engage operators, and from the regulators, uh, examples of the inability to first identify the signs of problem gambling and then act adequately. Okay, these are kind of the three key failings. There's obviously more, there's obviously different, it varies in every, every business, but these are kind of the three key failings we've seen. I've listed those areas now. What I'll do now is give you some examples of how we can implement things into our business to get away from this, to move forward, to improve this. Okay, we go through this a lot in, in a lot more detail when we, when we train and we do our reviews of businesses, but for a start, a start for 10, I'm gonna list three key areas where you can quickly implement into your business in a cost-effective way, in an efficient way, which if you do so, you're going to be able to kind of come against this and, and counteract that and improve the process in your business. The first point, the first kind of heading is ask the questions early. We've seen a lot of operators waiting to ask key due diligence information into customers until there's a, an alert, until there's a red flag, until the tr triggers hit or thresholds hit, and often that's too late. So you can't really, it's difficult to ask somebody for their source of wealth, source of funds, bank, transact, bank, tra bank documents, other key information, six, eight, ten months down the line of a relationship. Ask these difficult questions at the start of the relationship. It's the golden opportunity for you guys as operators to set the standard. If it's a new, if it's a new, if it's a new business, that individual has never been uh, privy to your processes, so you can set the standard of how you guys want to go forward. What I say is, ask more questions than you even need answers for at that particular moment. Because down the line, those questions you've asked will often help you identify with whether that person is spending, whether that person's gaming time is in line with what you know about them. Asking someone how they intend to fund their gaming is as important as asking what their name or date of birth is. And we need to get into that mindset as an industry. We've seen the benefit of this when we've, when we've gone into operators and implemented processes like this into businesses. The next point, the next heading is risk assessments, a living document. It's imperative that you guys have a good corporate or enterprise risk assessment and also a good customer risk assessment. But it's as important that your risk assessment is an evolving document. We've, been, we've seen operators often having really good risk assessments. However, they're setting appraisal periods, maybe uh, six months or 12 months down the line, depending on the, the initial customer risk rating. However, that's often too long to identify gaps and missing gaps for possible customer changing their prof customer profile changes. The risk assessment is there to identify changes in the customer at the earliest opportunity. It should be evolving with the customer's profile uh, and, uh, live and this will then help you, for example, with problem gambling, if somebody increases their gaming from what they've said in your application form, they'll probably spend between, you know, an hour or two hours a week in, in gaming, but they go to spend hours and on end in the weekends, weekdays, one and two in the morning, to identify that in a much quicker, much more efficient way. The next heading is technology and staff, not technology versus staff. Of course, we cannot function with the technology we used five, ten years ago as businesses, as operators. It's imperative to evolve, to enhance your business efficiency and your business profit. However, technology is only as good as a staff or the human or individual creating or using it. There's no point having the greatest systems 
if those individuals who are using those systems are not able to maximize the information to hand. We've seen some of the finds recently where you know, a number of, of, of the operators have had great identification uh, uh, customer uh, systems, great on monitoring systems, but they failed because their staff hasn't understand, doesn't understand how to submit an internal SAR process, or the MLRO hasn't submitted a SAR, process, SAR in, correct, in the correct fashion. So they're failing because of that, not because of te technology. The biggest risk in our in the industry around financial, cr financial crime, I call it financial crime rather than AML, because AML, is, I think we have this kind of closed uh, mindset when we say AML, or people trying to go into establishments with bags of cash, uh, laced with cocaine and then giving it over the table or through, through bank cards and then trying to get it back. The biggest risk in our industry is actual criminal property being permanently disposed in the business. That is still financial crime. Okay, if somebody comes into your business, if a criminal comes into your business and spends their criminal proceeds in your business permanently and lose it all, that's still financial crime. Okay? So, when we equip our staff with the correct knowledge, correct skills, what can then happen is that they're able, they're able to do the right thing when technology spots the wrong thing. Okay, and that's why technology and staff, not technology first staff, is critically important. Then we're just going to cover quickly in my last few minutes about what the future holds. Okay, there's, there's this intrinsic link now we're seeing of AML and problem gambling. So what I say to everybody here is if you're able to successfully combine your AML and problem gambling processes, you'd be much better equipped to identify if somebody poses a problem gambling, financial crime risk, or both, at a much earlier opportunity. You're then able to engage with the customer before they launder the proceeds of crime, or potentially have to self-exclude. Okay, it's what we call, as a business, something we call pre-crisis intervention. To be successful in this pre-crisis intervention, we must have, also have proper interaction. What does proper interaction look like? A lot of the problem has been around operators and their interaction with customers with potential problem gambling or financial crime issues. Our clinical specialists have researched types of interaction uh, which will open up the customer. Okay? As an industry, we've got to get away from what we call the auto response. A response that will get an automatic response from a customer whether they are in a situation or not. If we get this right, what takes place is something we refer to as a butterfly effect. It trickles down from the customer, through the business, through the industry, and to wider society. I haven't got enough time to go through a live example where, where I wish I wanted to do, where an individual in a regulated business uh, actually ended up reporting a SAR, and that actually ended up saving lives. That actually ended up stopping a terrorist attack in the UK to be the size or bigger than 7-7. Okay, that information came from somebody actually in a business, understanding and embracing the compliance culture, reporting that information, and actually stopping this, okay? What does the future hold? If we get it right, the future holds. The ability to maximize staff potential without spending a penny on recruitment when it comes to AML, when it comes to problem gambling. We will then be able to regain the public confidence in the industry, improve compliance culture and problem gambling management, safeguard customers, business, this is, and wider society, as I just mentioned. If we continue to get it wrong, then you're going to see government, ministerial involvement increase in the industry. Start to see more tighter, more draconian regulation and legislation, and potentially license revocations, which I think will happen if we continue to fail as an industry. But what we want to say is that we need to embrace this as an industry. There's no point operators moving forward and saying we're sustainable in an unsustainable industry. So it's about coming together. We engage with the regulators often to try to bring through this engagement, and we'll continue to do that. And we ask for all of you guys to try to embrace this to ensure that our industry can thrive and move forward in the future. Thank you. external investment for Africa to reach its full market potential
external investment and strategic acquisitions will be paramount. What are the common risks? The operational needs of the market? The most relevant areas for investment? What's the impression among African states on foreign partnerships? John Kamara, Global Gaming Africa. Hello everyone, good morning. How many of you have been to Africa? Raise your hand. So just about one third. How many of you would like to go to Africa? All right, let's go, come. <laughs> okay, um, it's interesting to have this conversation around, um, and it is a conversation that I'm going to have with you rather than trying to bore you with a presentation. Um, a lot of questions that I, you know, we get all the time around the African market is um, what we begin to see as a very interesting dynamics of an ecosystem. And just to start out, to give you some information, and we can catch up later, I'll give you statistics and stuff. As first of all, the growth, Africa is 1.4 billion people. Okay, and it's made up of 54 countries, so it's not just one big country. It's a lot of different countries with a number of different dynamics. 1.4 billion people, almost 640 million of those people are under the age of 29. So basically gives you a massive market economy of people. And out of that, over 800 million people are unbanked. They do not have a bank account. So again, but these people transact money in a number of different ways. And what we begin to see with, according to the African Union, which you know, brought out a report last month, that we are seeing a year-on-year -year growth in a number of different markets that is unprecedented at almost 113% in a number of different vertical sectors. So if you start analyzing that data and trying to understand, one, a very youthful economy of people, two, the consumption rate in a number of different countries in Africa has grown from what we used to know as single-digit numbers, 10, 15, to now multiple digit numbers at a 75% consumption rate amongst young people who are consuming. So what are they consuming? This is a very part of the interesting question before you start talking about investment into a market. People are consuming information, entertainment, data, and they're consuming financial inclusion. So when you look at how they consume this information, how they consume this information is here. So, the first conversation to have is, when you think about any form of investment into Africa, if you're not here, then it doesn't make any sense. Don't, don't even bother to try to come, because this is where the conversation is had. We have no broadband, we have no laptop, none of those things matter anymore, because everybody at this particular point is focused on the mobile phone. And that is where we now start the conversation around investing into Africa. Techno, I'm, how many of you know techno phone? Have you ever seen a techno phone? Techno, anybody? Nobody's seen a techno phone. Okay, techno is one of the Huawei. Have you seen Huawei phones, anybody? Just a few people? Okay, I mean, you, you can meet me later, I'll show you one of the Huawei phones. They're actually quite nice. They are real smartphones. And these smartphones cost $70. $70 for a real smartphone. I mean, it's not like your major iPhone, but it does everything else you need to do. Huawei produced 45 million phones in one country in Africa last year, Nigeria. 45 million phones that deposited into a market. Techno in Ethiopia this year have already done 27 million phones. Into the same market, into another market. So they've built one of the largest plants in the world at the minute in Addis. So basically, over the next three years, they estimate 254 million phones they would deposit into the continent. The reason why I'm giving you these stats rather than talking to you about pure investment is you need to understand, first of all, what the opportunity really is before we even start going into how do you want to invest or what do you want to invest. Now, 
coming from both gaming payments background and working in blockchain, when we look at the infrastructure that we don't have, and then we look at the infrastructure that we have, which is a mobile phone, you then focus you know, what you want to do in terms of investment. Another statistic that's very interesting. This year, uh, in the past 18 months, startups in Africa have raised $2.7 billion. This might not be a lot, but think about it this way. Three years ago, the whole startup sector in Africa raised $120 million. Fast forward three years to now, $2.7 billion for startups. This is completely unprecedented. We just had the first um, $4 billion companies in startups that were three years old in Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana. These companies are three years old. They've come from being completely zero, building a product on the mobile phone, to now being a $4 billion company. And what are the spaces that these companies are in? One, fintech. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the fintech space. Two, gaming, which is very interesting. And then the third part of it is everything that has to do with technology. So, but before we go into the fintech space, just again, the thriving youth economy across the continent is something that when you look at from East, West, South, and Central Africa, the most important thing that you find, the most important decision-making factor to help you decide about investing in Africa is the youth economy that we have. The youth economy that we have in the continent, we, we estimate illiteracy at about 47% at the minute. So we still have a lot of people who do not, have not gone to school, they don't know but. The important thing, again, all these people are connected back again through the mobile phone. So they have either their service, their lives, their ecosystem, whatever it is that they do on the mobile phone. And the, the, it's interesting because the Chinese companies who are now multiple markets across the African continent have decoded this value and how to approach these markets. And what we have seen is we've seen, I mean, WeChat just entered the African market uh, last week, and they estimate they have a, a projection of $250 billion that they're going to do in the next seven years. That's a massive organization in China. Uh, Alibaba just entered as well last week. And uh, we also had um, Tencent just got into the market as well, too. Um, NetEase, again, all Chinese Asian companies. Very straightforward. Critical mass, opportunity, we're going to go. We're not going to ask too much questions, first of all, because a lot of the things that you're worried about around compliance, or this, they might not have it. End of story. We're not even going to go into what they have or they don't. They don't. But what they do have is an opportunity. So how do you navigate that opportunity? That is a question, rather than, oh, are these people as compliant as I want to be here? It's never going to happen. Because you think about where you were like 20 years ago. What was, your, what was the compliance level? I'm, I'm Irish. I was raised in Ireland. So I know what was our compliance level in Ireland 20 years ago. It was like zero. It was literally where we were as a, con where we are as a continent. And having lived in Africa for the past four years, and you see the mistake that a lot of European operators or European investors do is they want to go into markets that resemble the markets that they know about. And then they go into a market that is just growing. How do you expect that market to have any semblance to what you know when it's a virgin opportunity? So you can't equate a virgin opportunity to something that's already mature that you know. And that is how you need to look at investment into Africa. And that is how the Chinese companies have been very successful looking at investment into Africa. So go back into fintech. I mean, a lot of you have heard about the bot fintech, right? I mean, ev everybody knows about fintech space, right? Fintech? OK. OK, good. So fintech Africa, um, three years ago, the World Bank had a, a conversation, and they said, look, there's two, two major markets in the fintech space, Asia and Africa, and to a small extent, South America, that are going to basically drive the financial inclusion model across a number of different jurisdictions. So what then happened was that because a number of people, I mean, remember I told you about over 800 million people who are unbanked, you know, but of these 800 million people, close to 70% of them actually do financial transactions on their phones. They do transactions on their phone, but they don't have a bank account. 
So my other colleague was talking about KYC and AML, which is a very interesting part of how you understand the dynamics of investing in Africa. So when you look at East Africa, where mobile payments is the largest form of payments, so if, we, if you navigate down into somewhere like Kenya, where M-Pesa controls 99% of all mobile transactions in the country, M-Pesa, the money that is collected by Safaricom, which is the company that runs M-Pesa, is more than all the money held by all the banks put together in Kenya. All the banks put together, one company that has a mobile wallet has more money than all of them put together. Does that make sense? So that tells you that over 70% of people have M-Pesa wallets, but they don't have bank accounts. They're happy they put their money in the mobile wallet, but they will never go to the bank. So this is the whole idea of FinTech Africa started off the mobile play. Um, if you go to somewhere like Nigeria, where a lot of people have card payments, so, but nobody has a credit card, everybody has a debit card, I know exactly what I spend. You know, I'm going to spend what I have, but I know what it is that I spend, because nobody's going to give me any extra money. So fast forward to three years, um, Backtrack to three years ago, one of the most interesting companies started in Kenya called Branch. And Branch basically said to themselves, you know, we're going to play in this fintech space. It's actually an American company, a couple of guys who came from the US and looked at the African market opportunity in Kenya. And what they did was look at how do we play financial inclusion? We want to lend money to people. We want to give money to people because that is the first start of financial inclusion. So let us build a solution on the mobile phone that allows us to lend money in real time just using your mobile phone data. So they aggregate your mobile phone data, they take that mobile phone data, and they make a decision in one minute where are they going to give you money or not. I mean, in, in a, number of, a number of markets, it's a bit of a crazy model because it doesn't make any sense. There is no... So what happened is you've seen a company like Branch that's gone from zero to a billion-dollar company. In gaming, very quickly, we've seen a company like Sportspressa that started four years ago, the first online gaming company in Kenya, and is now a sponsor for Everton Football Club. Sunderland, Everton, and they're now going to be listed on the stock exchange, but it's an African company that's come from zero. So the important thing, if you're looking at investment in Africa, you know, for rather than talking about what area it is, you need to understand the ecosystem of the mobile phone, and you need to understand the opportunity that represents of the critical mass. Thank you very much. Payment and IP blocking in Europe, Asia and the Nordics. A comparative approach. A distinguished panel will explore issues in Europe, Asia and the Nordics on IP blocking versus payment blocking, as well as the current state of competition in the Nordics from dot-com markets. Ilka Alda Settler, Barinius, Dr. Ola Wicklund, Wicklund Law, Asaf Stiglitz, Odds 1 times 2, Rolf Sims, Kindred, Robert Courtnage, Moorwand, moderated by Tal Itzhak Ron, Tal Ron Drehem and Co. Guys, good morning. Good morning, everybody. What a great crowd. <laughs> Fun, energy, for the fourth time, Sigma, listen, for us, being here for the fourth time, seeing how this show started from something really mm. small four years ago with, with Iman and with his team, and seeing it probably being now the, the, the best and the largest 
is the most important iGaming show worldwide. I think it's amazing and we need to do, first of all, a round of applause for, for the guys from Sigma. Really, it's, it's an amazing and I don't know where, where this show will be next year. And it's amazing and, and hopefully that all of the panel members are enjoying it as well. Yeah. So guys, we have in this, in this session today, uh, I, I got a distinguished uh, a panel of experts from all around the world for a very, very hot, very hot topic. We'll speak on payments, on IP blocking, and we'll speak about mm. Nordic regulation. We'll try to make it interesting and interactive all at once. So let's start for introducing with the guys from here. Came everybody from his own place, and we'll, we'll, first of all, Rolf Sims. Rolf Sims, even though his accent is very South African, because originally he's from South Africa, but he's, he's, uh, he's of course, Nordic. And everybody knows Rolf in his own, town, in own place of, of, of Norway. He was working 20 years for the civil service uh, for various uh, uh, regulations and for various uh, uh, ministries in Norway. But uh, recently, uh, since August, uh, if I remember, yes. in King, Kindred, everybody knows Kindred. They're the listed company. Uh, they, are, they have a good presence here in the show. <laughs> and now you're taking care of all the public affairs in Norway. So mm. thank you for joining us, Rolf. Thank you so much. Next to my left is Mr. Asaf Stiglitz. Asaf Stiglitz from Haifa, Haifa in the north of Israel. A very well-known affiliate, deals mainly with sports betting and affiliation industries. And for you, also, payments is very implicating your business, and also you deal with some Scandinavian clients. So I'm really happy that you came to us here. Thank you. Next, for the first, first time with me on stage here, and I'm really happy to have you here. You know, we, we enjoyed uh, February this year uh, with the UPay card, UPay card party in London, and now we have here Robert Courtnage, uh, is the director and the CEO of, of Morewand, which is the, the, the holding company of UPay card. I believe many of you are already working with the UPay card. It's one of the leaders in, in innovate, most innovative payment solutions. You have a booth there, and I'm really happy that you'll join us here Thank in this you. panel. Thank you so much, Robert. Robert hails from London. You can hear from the accent. <laughs> Next, we have Ola, he's, you know, when you open the, we can see that he's a Swedish, a classic Swedish, well-dressed and well-versed Swedish. He's the key, we call him the Keith Richard of Scandinavian gaming. Thank you for joining us. You were working in the past for Hansen. Now, a few years ago, he opened his own law firm, already successful and with a large base of clients. Uh, and Wickland Law, about him, and, and Matthias from uh, Malta is working with us, he's here. And also we have Nice and Karl Ron. Uh, so, really happy that you came from Stockholm to join us here in Malta. Last but not least, is there a direct uh, flight from Helsinki to Malta? Yes. There is? Wow, very nice. From Tel Aviv there is, very rare. So, I'm uh, really happy to have you here. Ilka. Ilka was inducted for the Hall of Fame of Lawyer in, in, uh, in uh, Finland, and he deals with uh, competition and antitrust and gaming, and uh, in, 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 in Helsinki is, is, uh, is uh, considered as a really uh, hero in, in gaming law, and I'm really happy that you took the time to join us to this panel in this type of the morning. So, thank you. We have here these people, and let's start. Let's start. I want to start with Rolf. Because we all know that something is going on there, up there. You know, if we, we're in Malta, probably Scandinavia is up there. And um, something is happening there. Let's, let us hear from you first, uh, from Wolf, about like the, the ecosystem, the current trend in the ecosystem in Scandinavia. Um, well, Scandinavia, in Norway, we have an exclusive rights model for gaming. The whole gambling market is founded on a state, two state monopolies. We have one big monopoly with Norsh Tipping, which runs um, uh, national lottery, sports betting, uh, iGaming, online casinos, they also run slot machines in Norway, scratch card tickets. Then we have another company called Norskeliks Total. They run the, all the horse racing as a monopoly. In addition, in Norway, we do have a substantial private land-based market, land-based bingo, land-based poker, and other forms of um, nationwide lotteries. Um, yeah, that's basically Norway in a nutshell. So we have Norway, we have Finland, we have uh, Denmark, we have Sweden. We have also Island. But when we discussed Island, you said, listen, it's a too small a market. Ilka, can you tell us more about Finland? What's going on in Finland? Uh, thank you, Tal. Uh, in Finland, we have a legal monopoly. Uh, Veikkaus uh, is the only operator there that can offer these gaming services to, to clients. However, it's possible to provide services online abroad, provided that you are not actively targeting the Finnish consumers. You cannot, for example, pay for YouTube stars to influence in the Finnish market, but, but you can have uh, very nice uh, sites in Finnish language and, 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 and you can have advertise, uh, advertisements in, in, the, in the European wide channels and all of that. 
So it, it, it's, it's really possible. But, but the interesting thing is that the Finnish Competition Authority has now questioned the whole system because uh, the Finnish Competition Authority thinks that the, uh, that the incumbent Veikkaus is too aggressively marketing itself in, in, in Finland and that's not uh, consistent according to the Finnish law. So it remains to be seen whether the Finnish market will be opened up very soon and, and, and these online providers are already doing that because Finnish Veikkaus uh, has to be very, very active in order to compete against them anyway. So, so, so I'm, I'm quite sure so, uh, something will happen and, and, and we will have a new government next year. So, so let's see. So politics is always a, it have an, has an impact. And, uh, you know, and as, as you said, many people say after, let's say, the wars in, in Sweden and the wars in Denmark have fall, maybe Finland will be the next thing. This is what you, you actually said. Most likely. Interesting. We uh, speak about Sweden, Ola, yeah. Dr. Ola. Yeah, uh, but the interesting thing with the Nordics is that uh, all four countries uh, are, have many similarities when it comes to political culture and heritage and so forth. But I think the biggest difference when it comes to Sweden is it's, it's a much more commercial market. Uh, and as you know, even today, even though we uh, theoretically have a monopoly, the, the whole market is flooded with gaming services uh, and, and mar marketing. And this is due to that the government wants to maintain the commercial freedom of the monopoly companies of Svenska Spel and ATG. And, and the private sector has benefited from that as well. So, but uh, uh, now the Swedish government has uh, uh, decided to introduce a, a licensing system which is coming into force on the 1st of January. And there will be around, like, more or less, give or take, 70 uh, applications and many newcomers to the Swedish market uh, uh, as well. And I think the biggest uh, uh, challenge, and then try to segue us into uh, the subject of this panel, will be to uh, uh, fan, uh, fence off uh, unlicensed uh, uh, operators, basically. What, what you say, Ola, if I understand correctly, when you speak about fencing, you see, you, you, what you say, is, and that will be the next topic that we speak about, uh, you say that the challenge will be to see how the regulator will protect the interest of genuine Swedish licensees yeah. from people, let's say, coming out of Malta or yeah. Curaçao and targeting your, your, your yeah. audience. The, the problem is, and the, that's the problem with any country in Europe, that uh, the arsenal of sanctions are, are many. Yeah. But when I speak to the head of the prosecutor's office and they, will, they just say that we have no resources to hunt down companies and CEOs around Europe and we mm. won't do that. We have enough on our plate as it is. So, mm. so I think that's the problem. In theory, uh, uh, there are sanctions available, but in practice there won't be any enforcement, I think. Interesting. Mm. Thank you so much, Ola. So we heard about the ecosystem, we heard about Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and, and we also want to understand, you know, we're, we're dealing here with gaming operations. The, the most important thing for gaming operation, you know, they don't do it for fun or, for, or as a non-for-profit, even though, you know, we have social gaming that can sometimes look like that. But, but we, we want to make sure that the payments are working and that is part of the business. And Asaf, you're, you're an affiliate. You're an affiliate, you're not an operator, you're not a lawyer, you're not a payment solution provider, you're an affiliate. You work with operators. And, and you know, when we discuss, we, we, we see that the, the payments industry actually have large influence on your operation. Can you explain how? Yeah, of course. Uh, at the end of the day, you want to get your payments and you want to get your money. And uh, even if you participate in a regulated market, white hat, etc., you are facing uh, lots of hurdles, starting with uh, establishing a company, uh, then getting a bank account is a huge headache, especially for people outside of the EU, like me from Israel. Uh, even the company is uh, an EU company, if you are an Israeli, it's a huge headache and it's a huge problem. And then the KYCs uh, that the operators want from you, uh, so uh, you find yourself uh, as a white hat affiliate handling a lot of uh, bureaucracy in order to get your payments and your money and your salary and uh, be paid for what you did for marketing uh, experience. Yeah, I remember stuff that you know you have issues. In the past it was much easier, you know. And an affiliate can open a company in Seychelles. I believe many people are missing those simple days. You can open a company in Seychelles or BVI over the internet. 
you open the company, <coughs> you bring players, you get your money. Easy as one, two, three. Now Asaf mm. had to open an European entity, right? Yes, you see, uh, before, as Tal said, uh, it was much easier. You could have an offshore company and uh, it worked swiftly, but uh, all the AML laws and the regulators, etc., made it very tight. And, and uh, even in Malta, for example, we see that the banks like uh, BOV uh, are making it uh, very difficult for affiliates, also maybe for operators, to receive their payments. And Malta is the center hub of iGaming. So especially if you are operating from Israel or other jurisdiction. Yeah. Robert, you're CEO of, of More One. More One is a leader in the, in the payments industry. You're based in UK. You're all your life living in UK. You don't have those hurdles that uh, Asaf speak. But I'm sure many of your clients have challenges. So there are challenges. Can you relate to the challenges that Asaf spoke about and some of the solutions that exist for, for covering these, these challenges? Yeah. I mean, so my, my background is 30 years as a, a payments lawyer specializing uh, across the whole of the EU. Um, and clearly, we've come up across these issues over many years. Um, on the positive side, I think the way in which the European legislation has come through, through the first payment service and the second payment service directive and the second e-money directive, and now we've got the fourth and fifth money laundering directives, the fourth one in, the fifth one coming in in a couple of years. Uh, these things are hurdles, uh, but at the same time, the way in which the second payment service directive has come in, uh, is being opened up, up the banks to, to payment service providers uh, and to try and bring in affiliates like yourself so that we're able to better onboard people. Uh, and, the, and the KYC is being clamped down on very severely uh, in MLD4 and MLD5. Uh, and we have all this source of funds issues for money remittance and money transfers. Uh, and then on top of that, you have to layer on the schemes. You've got the visas and the MasterCards, as well as Amex, China Union Pay, and the others. Uh, and the way in which they interpret the rules is very much based, uh, certainly with the main ones, is on US regulation. Right. Right. So you have US regulation, European regulation, and then you have state-by-state -state regulation, especially in the Nordics, uh, which can be very restrictive. So you find the regulators are asking the payment service providers, can you prove to us that the clients you're taking on in that country are doing regulated gaming? So that, like you were saying about uh, your new licenses coming in, uh, they wouldn't want us to take on a merchant that was providing gaming services in your country unless they had fulfilled criteria and were allowed to do it. Uh, and so we as a issuer of payment instruments, uh, whether they're vouchers or whether they're cards or e-wallets, very much have to comply with both the regulation and the scheme rules, uh, and that can make it difficult. So uh, right. I'm, I'm trying to facilitate as close as we can get to the, the guidelines so that we can make payments work. Yeah, and, and, and I actually see it on the day to day. You know, with working with your team, you're trying, you're exactly, you're some, you're between the operator and the affiliate, between the operator and the bank and trying to make sure that everybody is happy. As, as you said, all these KYC demands are coming and, and, and becoming more and more and more complex. And we cannot say that it's not for a reason, because we know that in this industry there are problems. There is crime. We, we all heard it uh, two panels ago. There is crime. And part of the, the, the way is to make sure is to make sure the, the, the industry will continue to flourish with, with the prevention. Of exactly. Crime. Thank you, guys. First of all, thank you, uh, Robert. And it's interesting to see how, how it will still be developed. You know, uh, in the past, uh, there was less uh, uh, type of, of banks, and now it's other type of banks. Everything is, uh, is, is evolved. There's Revolut, uh, which I think also should speak today, one of the representatives that also disrupt, disrupting the industry, specifically here in Malta. Uh, the, 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 there is the issue of Sata Bank that now uh, closed here in Malta, and our affiliates are, uh, who do not get their money from operators. And lots of new holders, but as, as we all know, they're all hope, hopefully to come to a solution and to, and to overcome I it. I just want to comment that uh, KYC, of course, is essential and very important, but uh, you see a large difference between uh, regulated operators. Some of them uh, are doing the, all of them are doing the KYC, of course, but some of them are sticking uh, hurdles in your wheels and uh, making it very hard for you, even pay. if you want, 
they, when they exactly. have to pay. Exactly. It's funny, exactly as you said. When they, want, when they get the money, it's not a problem. When they need to pay, the, that, the, then the KYC issue. Please bring us a, a statement with a European bank, with an IBAN, with a SWIFT, with three months, and with, uh, with everything. And, and that, that's, that's a problem because this is, people say it's not fair because the rules that changes in, in the middle of the game. We speak about payments, and let's speak about a very, let's say, sensitive topic. You know, um, for my, in my eyes, it's sensitive, but I think people in Scandinavia are saying, what do you speak? That's very normal. And I want to speak about payments blocking and about IP blocking. And the latter, the IP blocking, the domain blocking, for me, you know, as an Israeli who come from the idea of freedom of speech and democracy, it's crazy. You know, I remember we were discussing it, Ilka and Rolf and Ola, in Prague with, uh, with Nina from Denmark. She said, come on, it's something we're already, we're okay with this. And I'm speaking about blocking a website, okay? Blocking a website by a regulator or authority because they think it's not legal. Probably it is not legal or it's a gray market. This issue of an IP, internet protocol blocking, is something that I think it's quite, let's say, strict and maybe very aggressive. The other thing that I would like uh, us to compare is the payment blocking and to understand what is better. The payment blocking, let's say I think that this operator is working with a Curaçao license and he's working w w uh, to a, uh, across a jurisdiction where it's illegal to, to do it. And then the regulator blocks it on the payment side. So there's two issues, payment blocking and IP blocking. And I want to discuss these two, see whether uh, it's effective and whether it's, uh, is it uh, common. So let's start with, uh, with uh, Norway. What's going on in Norway, let's say, if you have an illegal operation? Well, in uh, Norway, we, uh, Norwegian authorities, they undertake payment blocking. This was enacted and adopted by the Norwegian parliament in 2008 and came into force in 2010. And is undertaken by the use of the Merchant Recovery Code 7995, blocking all Norwegian cards, and Visa cards and MasterCards, and also the Norwegian Gaming Authority can issue orders to banks to stop using certain bank accounts. Um, payment blocking has not been that efficient. The Norwegian authorities admit that themselves. This was stated in a parliamentary report, sent it to parliament in 2016. So at present, the Norwegian authorities are now looking at introducing more stringent regulations targeting third-party payment providers. Um, it's basically to make, tighten up and make things more stringent. And um, this raises many issues. So the first is the issue of proportionality. Should be, they use so many resources to obtain something that has a little effect? because there are always ways around a payment ban. The second is, should banks actually have a policing role? Should banks actually be policing gaming legislation? The third issue is the free flow of capital in, in the EEA, and also payment blocking can also affect other economic transactions undertaken by banks and third-party providers outside gambling. Then there's the issue of the, the free use of, of cash for a Norwegian citizen to p play on an offshore operator is not illegal should the government actually go in and stop people ha ha with the freedom of choice to use the money what they want to. So there are many issues here, but basically it's not working as intended. It's when interesting. It yeah. You spoke now about freedom of choice. This is something uh, we spoke about freedom of speech, but it's actually exactly what you say, freedom of choice. Let's and say a guy in Oslo want to hear aha, you know, Scandinavian music that I like from, from Norway, and uh, very popular also outside, I'm mm. sure. And they want to play, they're, they're coming from the, from the evening, and the most stereotypical Norway guy wants to, to play in an offshore casino. Uh, not even an offshore casino, it's a Maltese casino, mm. b based here, okay, and, and targeting you. And you, you say that there is a good, good question whether it's, it's allowed. It's, it's a philosophical question. I mean, there's a freedom of choice, because it's not illegal for Norwegians to play on a gambling site in Malta. I'm sure the government actually go in and say, you can't use the money on this, because we don't like it. <coughs> so payment blocking raises a whole lot of issues when it comes to the legality and lights of European Union law and the effectiveness, and also the principal discussion, should banks actually be, be given a policing role? You're right. When it comes to IP blocking, we don't have that in Norway. It's highly controversial, but it's being now considered by the Norwegian government. Interesting, so. interesting. Ilka. Yes, yes. This is a very, very good question indeed. Uh, in Finland, we are discussing the issue. There's a working group considering it mm. because of this fact that online service providers compete with bake house. But, but uh, it's, it will be very interesting to see what will they come up with. Uh, and, uh, and as I told you, we have this legal monopoly of Veikkaus, and there's one exception to that, actually, and that's uh, island of uh, Åland, Åland Island between Finland and Sweden, and there we have special regulation where, uh, where they have licensed PAF, PAF, to provide services in the island. 
Oh. And, and actually, they provide it in Finnish, and major bulk of their customers are from mainland Finland. So if we were to introduce IP or payment blocking, that would affect island of Åland and Puff directly. And that's politi politically very, very difficult, would I say. And, and of course, we have constitution constitutional issues as well, because it affects your freedom of speech and, 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 and all, all, all that. So I'm quite... Uh, I, I would presume that we will not have IP or payment blocking in, 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 the, in, in the near future. Very interesting. Robert, you're, you're a payment solution provider, and you know, probably for you it's very strange exactly as Rolf said, that a payment solution will be a policeman. What, what do you think about this you know, trend to see companies like you to become the policemen of the industry? So, the, the, there's, as I say before, there's two things. There's one, you're a policeman on behalf of the schemes because the schemes will give you massive penalties if you, if you breach their 8995 code. Uh, and then secondly, um, but less strongly, as you both said, because the regulators just do not have the bandwidth to deal with this, you have the breach of the local regulation, so in the, in the country you're in. Um, but in the UK, the same. The FCA won't even look at anything unless they've got at least six complaints. They're just so busy. Uh, and at the moment, we're spending all our time dealing with Brexit anyway, so they can't <laughs> even think. Um, so, yeah, it's unlikely that the regulator is going to come down on you, but it's highly likely that the schemes will come down on you. Uh, and, and they impose ridiculous penalties. Unbelievable. Uh, and you have no control over it, except... Now, in the UK, we have something called the Payment Systems Regulator, which nowhere else in Europe has got. It's a new thing. It's, it's part of the FCA. What is that? Uh, well, it's been set up. It's like another regulator, but it regulates the schemes. Mm -hmm. And it's the first one. I've, I've had meetings with them. And if the schemes are doing something wrong or they're out of kilter with competition, the PSR will actually go in and take action against them. They have rights to take action. <laughs> and it's the first regulatory body that can take action against the schemes. Yeah. I met them two years ago, in, uh, or one and a half years ago, in the Pay Expo in London, and I was shocked that there's something like this exists, and hopefully in other places it, it will be also introduced, because, you know, there's so many new things. There's, you know, you, you go outside, you see new PSPs accepting Bitcoins, okay? It's a new thing. You know, we have companies like Jupiter getting Bitcoins uh, and, and, and converting them to operators. We have uh, Trustly with Pay and Play now with new... It's, it's new things, and there should be, like, new methods to make sure that everything works and, and, and become, because each service like this has new, new advantages. And Ola, you know, we discussed it uh, uh, before, and, and I told you, listen, what's happening there in Sweden is interesting. It will have also impact on the ecosystem itself. Yeah, but, but, but if you discuss uh, geo-blocking or IP yeah. blocking and payment blocking, there are two, like, two different political concerns surrounding them, uh, as uh, Rolf said. When it comes to uh, geo-blocking and IP-blocking, that's a constitutional I issue and a question of democracy. And, and enshrined in the Swedish constitution, as in the Finnish and, and the Norwegian and the Danish, it's the freedom of the press and it's the freedom of expression, yeah. of course. So uh, geo-blocking is ruled out in Sweden. The only uh, very cute little thing that they're asking the internet providers to do is to have a warning sign, mm -hmm. you know, on unlicensed operators, a, a, a cute little warning sign that would actually probably attract. Where in the footer? Yeah, 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 yeah. In the footer or no, 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 somewhere on the on the web page. Somewhere, yeah, yeah, somewhere yeah. on the web page. I like that idea. So, so that will probably attract more players, you know, the, than to, 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 to be an obstacle. Uh, uh, but the, the interesting thing, I I think Sweden is very hesitant to to. Uh, uh, create obstacles to trade. Since we are like an, have a, had an internet penetration of over 90% for many years, uh, that's one thing. Uh, and when it comes to geo-blocking, we just can't uh, uh, risk uh, that geo-blocking will catch information that is constitutionally protected. Uh, and, and I think that's the story. But when we introduce the new licensing system on the 1st of January, there will be a pretty awkward possibility to, for the gaming authority to go to the court and ask for a payment blocking. But it's not criminalized. If you break the payment blocking, you can be, uh, uh, you have to pay, uh, I think the top uh, sum is 50 million Swedish kronas. Yeah. Which is like 50 million? Uh, it's, it's, it's 5 million euros. Okay, not a big deal. No, no, no not a big deal. Interesting. Not a big deal, but if you compare it to the GDPR fines, it 
probably the GDPR <laughs> fine. Our weather. Guys, it was a pleasure. Uh, and and we're just running, running out of time because we started a bit later. Um, any questions from the audience, guys? We, 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 we still can have. Even though yesterday we were here, no one, everybody was shy you know, to, to raise their hands. Do you have any questions? We have great people from that not normally are here in Malta. Any questions regarding payment blocking, IP blocking, Scandinavian? You have your leading experts that you can ask. I, I can raise one issue. I think that the next phase of enforcement in Europe by uh, gaming authorities will be, they will probably issue a number of fines now the coming, the coming months. Uh, we all know that. You know, uh, so, but the interesting thing will be, will these violations have any effect on the licensing regimes and the standing of the licenses in, in, in these jurisdictions? Mm -hmm. Because formally they should. Uh, but the, I think the Swedish Gaming Authority will take a practical stand because they want the channelization of, uh, of 90%. So they can't just, you know, throw out, you know, big op Swedish, Swedish operators, you know, from the licensing system. But that, I think that will be a new interesting phase, and especially for lawyers as well. We'll see it probably next year. We'll see it. Probably we'll, be, we'll have a sequel next year. Or even before. And guys, it was a pleasure for us. So I would like to thank again Ilka from Finland for coming for us, and Dr. Ola from Sweden, and Robert from London, from St. Mary's X, from the Gherkin building, one of the most favorite buildings in the city of London, and Asa from Haifa, and Rolf from Norway. Thank you, guys. Stay with us because we're continuing. Robert, you'll stay with us. And now uh, we're having our next one. Thank you so much. Guys. Thank you. innovations in payments. Fasten your seatbelts. Learn more about the trends and solutions in payments with this animated fireside chat. Tal Itzhak Ron. Tal Ron Drihem and Co. Robert Courtnage. More Wand. Wow. Everybody stayed. Everybody stayed, which is nice. It's a good fit, guys. Hope you enjoy, I hope you have a good time. I'm having here Robert Kortnij from the famous Kortnij family. In Malta, there is 10 families. The, I, I already counted them. The Azopardi, Attard, Kushkeri, Camilleri, and in London, there are so many. <laughs> and how many Kortnij are there? Uh, there's probably about 10 of us in the whole of the UK. 10, 10 of all, all the UK. <laughs> so Robert is 30 years of a payment lawyer. And uh, he's in the uh, UP card in More One, More One, the, the holding company. And I'm really happy to have you here to discuss the next uh, generation of payments uh, uh, company. So let me um, just say welcome and thank you all for staying on to just listen to me. Um, I've been a payments lawyer, as uh, we kindly pointed out, for over 30 years. Um, but I've been a CEO of a payments company for less than a year. Um, my view on this is we've got to try and create something better in this industry. I think uh, the whole bin sponsorship, the pay SR stuff, what's going on in payments has become very stale and we've got so much new in innovation coming through. We've got the blockchain, we've got cryptocurrencies, uh, we have fantastic regulation coming through in the second payment services directive. Uh, we've got some tricky legislation in MLD4 and MLD5. Uh, and then, of course, we have GDPR and crypto security, uh, which are, are coming up to try and trip us over. So we, we really do need to ask ourselves a question. How do we get through this myriad of rules, regulations, uh, and come up with solutions? And 
That's why I, I stepped in on board to be a CEO of, of Morwand, which one of our brands, which you'll be fully aware of, is, is UPayCard. Uh, we want to be there in the innovation side. We want to go beyond the sort of situation at the moment where you have issuers that are causing many roadblocks uh, to companies coming on board. Uh, too many issuers out there don't know where the gray stops and the black and white starts and finishes. This is actually, Robert, why you offer actually an all-in-one solution, right? You have more one, you have Paxep, you have uh, even try, try payments if you can discuss this solution. Yeah, yeah. No, so our, our solution is, is trying to offer something new. So one of the things we're bringing into Europe, which no one's done before, we're going to be the first issuers and are the first issuers of union pay cards which are a, a new solution. Uh, with Visa and MasterCard pushing away from cross-border issuance, passive issuance, uh, Union Pay are being a little bit more open on that front. Now, at the moment, in the gaming industry, because they're owned by the uh, Chinese government, they're still a bit restrictive, but we're starting to push that out because Union Pay is the brand outside China. So China Union Pay in China, very restrictive. Yeah. Outside China, we're starting to open those doors and create some, uh, some new momentum. Uh, and as I say, what we're offering is issuing, we're offering acquiring, and e-money and payment solutions. So coming up with mo modern solutions for IBANs, e-wallets, wire transfers, which is what you're all uh, used to with uh, UPay card. But, but why are we different? Well, number one, we're crypto agnostic. So we're working deliberately in the crypto space. So we're working with companies that are Bitcoin blockchain exchanges. So they're, they're creating abilities to use a physical card or a virtual card, Visa, MasterCard, UnionPay, to access your, your crypto funds, which this hasn't been done unique. before. This is very unique. And I believe many of the people know how it's difficult to bank with even blockchain ventures and even for blockchain magazine, you know, with the lawyers of News BTC, they are very well known in the crypto business. But many banks said, "Listen, we do not want to bank a company with BTC." But you, you did it. Your, your team did it. So what we've done is we've created a, a blockchain policy, a Bitcoin cryptocurrency blockchain policy, right. which we are getting approved by the schemes, the Visas, the Mastercards, Union Pays of this world. And if we want to onboard a company that's right. in that space. They have to comply with our policy, and I think we're the first uh, issuer and acquirer that has such a policy in, in exactly. place. Which is nice. Um, as I said again, we're not just black and white. Um, being a lawyer for 30 years, I know where the the grey bit ends, and so where other providers may cut you off with their KYC AML process earlier, we're prepared to go that further step. We know where it ends. And we're scheme and regulatory friendly. I've, I've been working with the schemes as their lawyer for the last 30 years. Right. I've been working with all the regulators across Europe for the last 30 years. So they know me, they trust me, uh, and we can work with them to create solutions for this market. And finally, f on the previous slide, fast decisions. I'm, I, I, I sign contracts quicker than anyone else. I did an 80-page contract. I negotiated it in 20 minutes because I'm both CEO, so I can make the decisions as principal. I'm the in-house lawyer, and I'm the compliance. So I can make decisions. We can do things quickly and efficiently. So That's we get exactly. things through. That's exactly. And it's a very difference, you know, because in this issue, in this business, we're not only speaking about the big fish or the small fish. We're speaking about the faster fish and the slower fish. And as, if you be faster and efficient, we're trying to be the, so also as lawyers, to be fast and efficient, it will be better service. And that's the same, that's all what we're trying to do in this industry. So our capabilities, as I've said, I mean, this is repeating a bit, but we've got agency with the EMIs and PIs in multiple territories. Uh, we're also looking at other territories. So Israel, again, we're, we're getting a license in Israel so that we can issue over there, which will be very useful, I think. That for me, very <laughs> Even though it's a very small, you know, Israel, we speak about it with, with Asaf or with Jenny and with Jenny. It's a small, you know, but you still want to, it's like a challenge. Why are well, you we, we want to be global. Um, I'm, I'm looking at Asia Pacific, uh, and finally, I will be looking at the US. But w over the next few years, we're looking at expanding well outside Europe because everyone wants global solutions. No one wants a payment solution that only works in Europe. It's, it's, it's too limiting. Uh, we want to remove borders while Donald Trump wants to put them up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and we have a larger risk appetite than traditional bin sponsors because we know those guidance. So um, we flip. Yeah. Um, so it's a bespoke risk-based approach. Uh, as I say, onboarding and compliance, clean and frictionless. Uh, I don't know many bin sponsors that could say that. 
Um, we've got operational efficiencies, which everyone knows about from the UPay card team. Very friendly, efficient people that just want to get the job done. All of them are from Moldova, which is also one of my favorites. You can see their <laughs> booth S333 there in the end. Nice people, very motivated and very friendly, which is nice, you know? And we, we try and keep it simple. We, we, we're agnostic to scheme, processor, bureau, whatever. We, we work with anyone. Um, and we have a very simple pricing. And we're, we're the people you want to do business with. We, we want to go out there and do business with you guys. Uh, we understand your industry better than anyone else. And we just want to open the doors. Um, and just to understand the branding, so more ones you won't have seen, but this is our branding, this is our logo. Uh, we have been sponsor solutions, and under that branding, we also have the UPay card solution, which you're all familiar with, uh, and will continue to run. And then we have a new brand called Paxept, which is a merchant acquiring solution. So we have three different solutions. And all in-house. And you have also, you didn't mention it, but something that some of my friends and some of my clients actually use is what has been originally known as Finance Land, and now, now they call it a, a tri, tri Payments. So Tribe Payments yeah. is, a, is a brand new processor that's originally finance-wide, but it's come through, and it's the first pr processor for the whole of Europe to do union pay. So we're working together with, with Tribe, and you'll hear a lot more about Tribe next year. And um, Suresh has been speaking uh, in a panel with me in the Lisbon Affiliate Conference. He's a great guy, great guy. Suresh, also based from London, and very yeah. knowledgeable. And our aim is to be this uh, first bin sponsor unicorn. So I hope you like our, our nice wheelie bin with a unicorn in it. Um, we are the newest, freshest, and most innovative payment solution in the marketplace, and we want to do business with all of you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Any questions for Robert, guys? So thank you, Robert. Thank you, guys. Let's have a great session. There are lots of interesting <coughs> sessions today, also on, on crypto and fear to crypto and banking for the unbanked. Stay here. Thank you. Challenges within high risk industries. Victoria Soltes. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, to Sigma, for uh, having me. And uh, thank you for all of you who attend uh, to this payment meeting. Um, I will have a couple of words about the payment challenges within the high-risk industries. I think it's a very uh, common subject and uh, many of you are very interested because we are all working within uh, the high industries, high-risk industries and uh, the banking uh, possibilities and the payment service provider possibilities are always limited for us. So a couple of words about me. Uh, I used to live in Cyprus for the last 10 years and uh, in Cyprus, just as in Malta, the leading uh, businesses are always the high risk ones. I've got 13 years of um, international uh, experience with tax and finance. Uh, I'm originally uh, an accountant and I've got seven years of uh, C-level experience, so I have first-hand experience of uh, the struggles of these high risk industries. I used to teach in the university as well, lecturing financial subjects, and uh, my main experience, what I really specialized at in the last couple of years, is actually the high-risk companies. I've got clients uh, from non-regulated investment firms, forex companies, binary companies. Uh, I used to work with blockchain and uh, pharmaceutical companies as well, just as well as gaming. And you would even think that the pharmaceutical companies are high-risk companies. Yes, I do have a client, actually, who uh, was selling tab uh, tablet pressing uh, devices online and uh, binders for tablets. And even though there is nothing illegal in that, there is nothing uh, weird about that, it's, it's actually classified as a high risk. And he was really, really struggling to, to get any kind of banking or uh, payment service pro uh, provider for his, uh, his, his business. So it is a very uh, wild industry out there and everybody is classified to be a criminal. So unfortunately, we have to prove ourselves right to be good enough for the banks. 
It's a very funny life out there. You never played banking. It's easy. First you give me the ball, then I charge you every time you want to play with the ball. And I will also charge you if you want to give the ball to someone else and a small monthly fee for holding onto your ball. Does it seem fair to you? If you actually explain this to anyone out there, everybody would say, no, what is going on? This is just so unfair. Although this is exactly how banking is working. The banks are actually working nowadays more likely against you than with you. So the bargaining power has changed completely. Today, the banks select their clients, not the other way around. So what is going on? Basically, the carrot is eating the rabbit, right? The bank is no longer a service provider. The bank is, giving us a is doing us a favor to have us as a client. And we have to work with banks because we are running an online business, so we are can cannot actually base our uh, income on a cash-based uh, economy. So what we have to do as a high-risk industry to be fulfilled with all the uh, specifications and the requirements for the bank. First of all, we have to deal with security. Everybody heard about that, uh, the PCI DSS. If you are accepting cards, online or offline, you have to either work with a PSP, you have to, or you have to get a certification on your site. You should prove yourself that you are good enough to monitor uh, and audit your systems periodically, you should prove yourself that you are trustworthy enough to collect all the data for your clients and handle those data. You are the one who has to pay money to prove yourself that you're good enough to handle all that data. It's all your cost. The second one is the fraud and the chargebacks. How much we spend to actually identify the fraud, try to find against the chargebacks, try, try to prove out to the world that, yes, I am a legitimate business. I earn this money with good intentions. You spend a lot of money actually just to integrate new systems within your business. And it's, again, it's all your cost. All those cross-border transactions are extremely difficult and very expensive. It's not unusual that if you're expecting payment from some other country, even other continent, they are charging you up to 10%. How is it fair? It's very, very demanding. And all these integration is very hard because the national bankings cannot really deal with the, with the integration of the cross-border payments. The next one are the rapid changes. You should be always up to the speed, up to the level uh, of dealing with the new requirements. What happened with the dollar? At one day, you can accept dollar payments. The next day, you cannot because of the political changes. Again, it's your responsibility as a business owner. And finally, the technical integration. Again, how much money do we spend just to actually reconcile the different systems? You have to get your PSP, your gateway provider, uh, your bank, the acquiring bank, and your own system lined up and investigate all the differences. Again, it's your time, it's your cost, because it is your money. So the PSP and the gateway providers are working through a four-way communication. First of all, you're the merchant. Uh, everybody goes through your merchant website. The customer is having a communication with you. However, at the background, you've got the payment gateway, which is communicating with the PSP, which is communicating with the acquired bank. So the communication are so many ways, so many opportunities to just, to just to get it wrong. If one communication channel has some issues with it, imagine by the time the circle gets around, how does it affect you as the merchant? It's actually a four-way communication, and once you call the support contact centers, I'm sure that everybody's familiar with that, there's a uh, nice lady at the end of the line who has no clue about any kind of technical information. They cannot really help you out. Again, what happens? 24-hour delay, getting back to you. Your business is the one who is suffering. Again, if you would like to get some new PSPs on board, it's a very slow implementation. It could take up to six to eight weeks. So we are in a constant seek for new PSPs as we are getting on new uh, markets. We want to give better customer experience and getting on new markets. It's an ongoing challenge. 
conflict of interest. The clients want to work with new PSPs. The PSP want to onboard new clients, the, but the acquiring banks have strict regulations and compliance to deny the high-risk applications. So it gets more and more expensive and more risky to bank for these high-risk clients. So the licensed entities are on the high risk. Hooray, I'm licensed. But no, I'm not good enough for the bank. So why is it? Because there is no general criteria about what is good enough. The banks have their own risk assessment, which is not necessarily the same as the government's regulation. So now you've got the government regulation against a public company, which is a bank. And you have to prove yourself good for both of them because there is no trust. So what's the solution? Maybe a common licensing criteria is needed this time. If I'm good enough for the government, I should be good enough for the banks as well. So what's the way forward? Maybe a new banking attitude. You, st you should uh, seek for low-risk PSPs and uh, stable providers, which are the safest, but obviously the hardest to be accepted. So maybe the banks should change their attitude, but the goal is a complete transparency. And for the last, I brought you a very interesting slide. I'm sure that uh, many of you have seen that before. Before, what happened was, it's you, your money at your bank, going through different PSPs to pay someone else's bank to reach the money uh, to the end beneficiary. After what happened with Bitcoin, everybody was so confident about it. Yes, we've got the Bitcoin network. It's a one-way step. The money reaches the person that I'm intending it to. But what's the reality now? It's getting more and more complicated. So as I said, the goal is the complete transparency. It's your responsibility to comply. It's your money and your time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. IPO versus ICO, opportunities and challenges. Let's explore what an IPO and ICO bring to the table and how regulation and due diligence can influence investment strategies. Adam Kostyan, NASDAQ. Patrick Kadletz, BitBay Pay. Moderated by Joachim Faulkner, Baker McKenzie's. So hey everyone, uh, I'm Joachim Falkner, I'm a lawyer from Stockholm, being at Baker McKenzie. Um, a bit uncertain whether we have slides to access, uh, but otherwise, uh, let see, let the gentlemen here introduce themselves. Yeah, so Adam Kostjal, I head up our listing franchise for NASDAQ. Uh, so in Europe, uh, NASDAQ acquired the Nordic exchanges. Uh, in 2008, so I run and operate the listing business for those seven markets in the Nordics uh, and uh, also European companies going to the US. And of course, this iGaming, or the, rather the iGaming sector has become a key sector for us on our Nordic exchanges, or primarily Stockholm. Okay, my name is Patrick, uh, Patrick Ellis. I'm the CEO of uh, BitBay Pay. Uh, which is a part of the group of uh, BitBay, uh, which is also an uh, exchange, crypto ex ex exchange. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, we, we came here to uh, talk about the ICOs because we, we see that from the perspective of, uh, of uh, listing those, uh, those tokens that, that uh, yeah, so, so 
it's a good pleasure to be here. Yeah? Great. So should we structure this that, Adam, could you please just tell us about uh, what, yeah. is, what is Nasdaq doing in, on Malta and uh, w w what do you bring to the table? Absolutely. Maybe I, I'll see if I have some slides which I can refer to. Uh, maybe they can put them up on the screen. Um, if not, then uh, basically, I mean, if, if, uh, one, one thing that I was reflecting on when I stepped on stage here is that who would have said that Malta would have become the natural center for iGaming uh, several years ago? Uh, I think it's been a fantastic development for this market. It's been very adoptive, quick to adopt this sector, very pro from a regulate, regulatory point of view. And then the same thing goes for Stockholm uh, or the Swedish market, where essentially that has become the natural hub for this sector on the public markets. Uh, we've seen a fantastic development over the years in terms of a number of operators where the know-how has spread very rapidly uh, amongst the different peers. Uh, and there is a fun fundamental critical mass of operators in this space. And as these operators have grown, both in terms of providers of technology, but also operators in the space themselves, we've seen them take on the public markets. And when in 2012, when I stepped into this role, we were still discussing, should Stockholm be the natural place to list? Uh, is it London? Uh, why, etc. And what we've seen is since 2012, independent of the sector, we've listed 500 companies. And really what is at the core is that we are able to list small, medium-sized growth companies uh, and take them on into the public markets and give them access to capital, give them access to visibility, give them access to liquidity, uh, not only on the day of the IPO, but on a continuous basis. And this sector was very quick at adopting that opportunity in the public markets. We saw that with Unibet, we saw that with Betson, and now in the latest wave with providers such as Evolution Gaming, Leo Vegas, and we've also started to see international operators starting to look at Stockholm as a natural hub. So Aspire Global from Israel listed on Stockholm and has out really outperformed the markets and has a strong buy in the market right now. And I just met Motti and talked about this, where he finds that the Stockholm market not only has a strong equity culture and an understanding of how to support companies and list on the market, but now also has sector expertise. So you have a critical mass of peers, you have a critical mass of investors, analysts, etc., that really make this an ecosystem which is competitive not only from a Nordic point of view, but on a global point of view. So really, today, we are the largest market in terms of number of listed companies in this space, and we're seeing a continuous inflow of companies wanting to list in Stockholm, both from the Nordics and also internationally. Yeah, great. And, and let me just echo that. Uh, obviously, looking at this from a legal point of view, we're two Swedish guys sitting uh, on Malta, and, and we've done the, the IPOs of, of uh, Leo Vegas, uh, been involved in Mr. Green, Catena Media, Aspire Global. Obviously, uh, companies with, with either being Maltese issuers or having uh, significant Maltese operations. So. It seems like the, the road is really open between Malta and, and Sweden, uh, not only, only from a legal point of view, but also from a commercial point of view. Do you agree on that, Adam? Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, I think not many would have forecasted you know, Brexit taking place. Uh, that, uh, let's see if it happens, uh, but and in what form it happens. But certainly that uncertainty that has uh, surrounded that decision process has not been favorable for the IPO market overall uh, in London. And uh, what we're seeing now is that growth companies are really trying to explore the IPO route as a strong alternative. And when they see their peers, and of course the critical base that you have here, a critical mass of companies, when you see your peers listing on other markets, you start exploring, could that be an alternative for yourself? And I think the Swedish market has started to become very receptive, not only for Nordic opportunities, but for international opportunities, because they see the opportunity in the sector, they understand the sector, 
and they want to find the best companies in that sector, and they want to bring them to the local market, which is Stockholm, where we have both a growth market, NASDAQ First North, with slightly less regulatory environment, and then we have the main market. And the interesting thing is that we've had 75 companies transition from the growth market to the main market over time. And I think in particular with this sector, I think with the overall regulatory sort of scrutiny that's coming into this space, mm -hmm. I think the fact of being a listed company actually adds to the credibility uh, for that long-term play. Uh, in addition, I think the other factor which I think is developing I in this space, which is natural development, is consolidation. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you have an asset like an equity, uh, it puts you in a position to really uh, be an acquirer or potentially as a visibility in terms of the results that you're performing to be acquired. And we're seeing that now with Mr. Green having a bid on itself uh, from, uh, from the UK. And, and we're seeing other providers that are listed with us making acquisitions. So it's, it's really a platform for growth. Mm. Um, and obviously we've seen uh, all, the, all the companies that have been listed in Stockholm uh, from Malta or with Maltese operations, Leo Vegas, Evolution Gaming, Catena Media, Mr. Green, they have started on, on a smaller market and then moved up to the main market. So obviously a very good platform for purposes yeah. of developing. And I think it's not only the, I mean, we'll come to the ICO piece, but I yeah. think that the, 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 the true strength in the <coughs> Stockholm market is the equity culture that exists there. It, it, fundamentally, 80% of the population owns shares either directly or indirectly. That means that you have every household engaged about the opportunity of creating wealth around uh, equity. That's a very unique situation if you look at it from a European level, which is typically more debt-driven. Mm. And that's really the fundament of what is going on in Stockholm. Yeah. Then, in addition to that, you have sector expertise, which iGaming has become a leading sector and where the Swedish market or the Nordic market is, a, is one of the leaders in this space. And we've seen that with, as you mentioned, Evolution Gaming, Catena, Leo Vegas, and many others that have really positioned themselves as not only players, but growth players with ambition uh, and where the uh, equity markets and the exchange can really leverage, give them a platform for growth. And I think one more aspect which I think is interesting now is that when you start looking at the US, the fact that you are a listed company, mm. the fact that you are a, a credible player will hopefully help these companies when they start evaluating, whether it's phase one or phase two, in their expansion plans into the US. Mm. Uh, I, I hope that the fact of them being listed will minimize this or increase the comfort zone uh, for different parties, both the regulators but also the commercial counterparties in engaging with these companies. Mm. So, Pat Patrick, obviously a lot of focus being on the equity side uh, on, the, uh, on the stock exchange in Stockholm. But what about ICOs? How, how can that compete with IPOs? Yeah, so we are on, like, uh, mm, we are on, the, on the other side, yeah, of, yeah. Uh, of, of the... <laughs> on the <laughs> evil side. Yeah, so, so I have Mackenzie and, and Nasdaq, uh, so I need to be... Uh, I'll, uh, to uh, talk about the ICOs that we we gone uh, last last year uh, and in this year, so uh, as you know, uh, last year was a massive for for uh, ICOs, yeah, and uh, so uh, for the startups that uh, even even they go to VC uh, get as asking for ten ten million dollars, yeah, uh, it would be not not possible before ICO, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so this uh, this uh, 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 trend, I can I can say, it was uh, really you know uh, so, so something extraordinary when you, when you compare to to yeah. uh, IPOs. Yeah. So, but uh, b because there there is no no regulations, uh, uh, the, the ninety five percent of of those uh, uh, companies uh, just co collapsed. Yeah. In the, in the first uh, uh, three four months uh, after getting getting the uh, token uh, listed. Uh, I think uh, this year, next next two years, it will be something like a, uh, like a 
combination be it, be, uh, with IPO, say, uh, ICO, so STO, security or equity uh, tokens. So uh, I think those, those two worlds, uh, like uh, old, old school <laughs> and, uh, yeah. NASDAQ uh, and, and other, other exchanges, uh, national exchanges, uh, it needs to com combine with uh, uh, blockchain technology. Yeah, but I, I can give my, my sort of view on it. And I, and I think, you know, as an exchange, we look at ICOs very carefully because we see that as an opportunity, but also as a competition. Uh, so I think what is, you know, there's a lot of money out there in the markets today. You can raise money both in private or public environments, whether on the exchange or outside the exchange. I think at the end of the day, when you raise money, it comes with a responsibility. Yeah. And I think the ICO market has had the challenge of the cryptocurrency fluctuations with a lot of volatility. But then you've also had the responsibility fluctuation in terms of, you know, the credibility in that space has not really grown to become established. And the credibility of leveraging the ICO it has not really sort of cemented itself. And I think that is a challenge because if you don't build the credibility, whether it's on the IPO market or the ICO market, that will never be a long-term solution. And I think from our perspective, in this space, I think the ICO could be a very attractive proposition over time because it's very efficient. Uh, the distributed ledger technology that blockchain has to offer is also very sort of transparent. Uh, but I think at the, at the end of the day, what I think the ISO really has against itself is the transparency issue. Mm. Uh, it has the credibility mm. issue. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, the ones that are really successful with the ICO are the bigger brands, you know, like when Telegram does it or uh, yes. etc. So I think it's still yet to be proven as a common way of raising money. And I think to your point about the uh, tradability aspect, because I think if you compare an IPO mm. versus an ICO, when you've done an IPO, you have an equity. That equity That's is I... tradable, it's liquid, both for the investor, but also for the owner. Uh, and I think these are key assets that have to be translated into what I know many markets are looking into now. How do you create that liquidity? How do you create that credibility around that platform? Yes, yeah, so, so I, this is what I want to address. The STO or equity is, right. is something uh, that uh, if, if I buy a token for, from you, yeah, if you're issuing the yeah, ICO, uh, right now I need to have uh, equity yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in the space of the, of the, uh, the new, 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 new uh, company. Mm. But also, um, it's not like, like it's something com com uh, uh, the uh, crowdfunding, yep. something between crowdfunding and the uh, IPO. Yes, so, so we need to create something like this. Uh, so users can uh, make make the uh, uh, equities, but also get tokens. So so it, it mixed together. Listen, I, yeah. we we are a big investor in blockchain. Uh, we do several blockchain projects. We're staying clear from Bitcoin uh, as far as possible uh, right now. Uh, I think it comes with the credibility aspect uh, towards our investors. I think. I think maybe one thing that should be done is from a sector to sector perspective, the sector should take responsibility to decide what is best practice within the sector to raise money if it truly believes that the ICO or the STO could be an alternative. I think if the sector defines what the standard should be, what best approach to have versus that sector or, or that alternative, then I think that could create you know, confidence in the market. Right now, independent ICOs popping up every now and then is not really a credible way of growing that platform or that way of raising money. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there could be a resp an opportunity for the sector to define how are we going to leverage this ICO offering or STO, et cetera. Should we see if we have any questions from the audience so far? Uh, time is not running up, but uh, approaching the line. Any questions on IPOs or ICOs for Maltese issuers so far? So otherwise, Patrick, what, what's the next, next step on Malta then? Yeah, so, so uh, as an exchange, we already uh, 
uh, doing the uh, license mm -hmm. uh, to, to be there and operate from 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 Malta. Yep. Uh, yeah. So so we 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 think that uh, the Malta is is the number one in the in the legislation and in in, uh, in in Europe. We will see what happens in the, in the next next months when uh, countries like Germany or France will uh, also. Uh, do, do their 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 uh, regulations and the European Union? Yeah, this is this uh, thing that we uh, uh, we also looking for. But yeah, but for the motto is right now our our uh, uh, place to 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 uh, you know. and and to ad address those challenges which Adam mentioned. What, what uh, so uh, many, many things happened. Uh, yes, last year and this year, uh, like KYC AML, it, it was it wasn't before. Yeah, in the. Yeah. In the, the Last year, so it's one thing. <coughs> Second is uh, uh, the, the companies want to kind of regulate, it. and uh, uh, for the biggest ones are the Telegram, yeah, for example, 1.7 yeah. billion dollars. Uh, uh, so, so it, and it was in, in private private sales. Correct. Yeah? Yes. Uh, so I think those things need to be. Uh, uh, you know, uh, listed mm. how it should be done, and then yeah, the, the, then I think I see we will transform to to STO, and some 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 ex exchanges will will take it as a as a as some uh, as as a new venture, yeah, or a new new uh, well, we'll tool. See. tool. We'll see. I see. Uh, and yeah. and yeah. So, for no. example, Liechtenstein, they, they they don't have a, a, yeah. a, a exchange, so. For those countries, uh, could be a very, very good alternative. Yeah. No, I think there's an opportunity for many countries. A bit like uh, like Malta was very uh, Malta was very opportunistic and long-term vision in terms of creating a regulatory environment, which was created confidence, trust uh, to build up uh, a base for different growth companies within different sectors. And I think Malta has been very successful in that. And I'm sure. Other countries will also try that the same model uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, uh, etc. Um, I think EU. The last thing EU should try to do now is to have 27 different policies in terms of uh, how to approach the yeah. sector and, and so on. I don't think that's uh, that. That would be too too unorganized and un opportunistic. So. I think creating a, a level standard playing field is the best approach rather than trying to create an opportunistic approach around this. Uh, then certain company, uh, countries will be more open to it. I, uh, we as an exchange are staying quite clear from ICOs right now. We use blockchain as a technology, but we're staying away from ICOs. We think, although we're not operating here in Malta with its warm weather, and fantastic uh, culture here. What we have in Sweden is a unique equity culture, and we're building off that. And that's what we're trying to make sure that the international markets, independent of the iGaming sector, but international companies in growth sectors, evaluate Stockholm as an alternative as the public markets are becoming more uncertain, unpredictable. Uh, I think what we have in the Nordics is a unique asset, and I think it should be leveraged and assessed by growth companies going forward. And that's why we work with Baker in terms of helping companies understand what does it mean to IPO, what, how do you approach it. And it's not only IPO, because if you look at what Aspire did, Aspire Global being an Israeli company, Gibraltar based, they repositioned themselves in Malta. Uh, they then raised 40 million euros uh, on our growth market uh, and then did a bond uh, for 25 million euros. And this was further down the line. So the, in this space where you have a very cash flow rich business, the bond market is very active in our space. So we have several of our providers, uh, operators in the iGaming space that have also done bonds as a listed company or before a listed listing. So I think that's where we want the sector to be in terms of understanding that's, you know, that opportunity. And both us as an exchange and Baker as our advisor are there to talk to companies to help them assess this alternative because the first assumption is maybe I should do this in London, but my recommendation is uh, until they've figured out what's going on with Brexit, then I would s assess Stockholm. It's a bit colder, but <laughs> the equity market is a lot warmer. So uh, I encourage you to approach us and, and uh, have a dialogue. And 
if you feel that ICO is a, is a better alternative. Uh, I, I mean, I, good I, luck. I agree, Adam, and obviously the commercial aspects are there and the legal aspects are obviously there as well. We, there, there is a clear set of, of possibilities to actually list a Maltese entity in Stockholm. We've seen it uh, numerous times and it's uh, several ongoing It's a well understood well. so, concept. And for that purpose, we have also, uh, together with Nasdaq and, and WH Partners, a Maltese law firm, completed a, a Q&A for Maltese issuers looking to list in Stockholm. So we will have it provided uh, uh, at the end of the room here, so it's um, available for everyone. And anything to say uh, from you, Patrick, before we end up? I think in the next, next uh, thing is, is uh, STO, actually. Yeah. So uh, ICO is, is, is done. Everyone knows how, how it Great. works. So STO for me, for me as a competition to, uh, you know. We welcome that. that. <laughs> we welcome that. I think yeah. the more uh, participation from an equity point of view, whether it's STO or IPO, is good for the market. Uh, but I would approach it that get this sector to really define what the standard is for this sector yeah. Yeah. and how to approach it, because I think that would benefit uh, new adoptions of uh, whether it's ICO or STO. So thank you everyone. If you have any questions regarding IPOs, speak with Adam and myself and uh, ICOs, Patrick is uh, ready to go. So any questions before we end up? Great. Thank oh, you. Thank Enjoy you. the conference. Thank you. better banking experience. Digital transformation is the new buzzword in banking circles. Archaic banking systems have stifled the advancement of technology. But Revolut is born 100% digital. For Revolut, the future is here and banks are already late. Dimitris Litsikakis, Revolut. Hello everybody, good morning. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here with you again today in Malta. My name is Dimitris Litsikakis, country manager for Revolut in Greece, Cyprus and Malta. And I'm here to share with you a couple of uh, thoughts about, you know, the future of banking. So, um, let me start by showing you a really cool video. I hope you like it. Banks have failed to move with the times, but we don't need them. Back in 11th century Italy, merchants from all over would exchange their different currencies for trade outdoors on benches, which is where we get the word bank from, banca. They started as a way of making our lives easier. Unfortunately, this all changed. As the bank profits grew bigger, customer experience was lost in a maze of paperwork and bureaucracy. They invented new and complicated ways of growing their margins, built on hidden fees and taking liberties with their customers' money. But there's a solution. Revolut Metal, a stainless steel car that does more than just look good. An authority to tear down borders, make our finances as mobile as we are. Free to spend in 130 currencies worldwide at the real interbank exchange rate. Think sending unlimited amounts of money abroad with no fees, with free worldwide travel insurance. Think seamlessly buying and selling cryptocurrency in seconds and earning cash back instantly in the fiat or cryptocurrency of your choice. Access to 24-7 concierge from your phone to book what you want, when you need it. For a truly borderless lifestyle. And all this in your pocket. Demand more from your bank. Revolut Metal. Radically better. Yeah, radically better. Better. So, what's Revolut? Revolut is a fintech uh, startup that launched three years ago. We are based in the uh, UK, in London. Uh, we raised a significant amount of money, $336 million at the $1.7 billion valuation. Uh, we're really proud of uh, what we're doing. Uh, so let me get you, you know, the core product. What Revolut is, is a solution for everyone out there to exchange, you, 
uh, between currencies, 24 major currencies using the interbank rate. So no more ripple fees from the banking sector. Send and request uh, money from anywhere in the world, again, without any fees. It's, it's so magic, it works perfectly. And you can also spend all your money that you have on your Revolut account with, uh, with a Visa or MasterCard payment card. Um, anywhere you go in the world, you can spend or get money from an ATM. So, what about the growth? Um, we are very pleased to announce that we are now 3 million users using Revolut throughout uh, the, uh, Europe. Actually, this is 3.2 these days. We have to keep updating the slides very, very often. Uh, and especially in Malta, we are very proud to have more than 50,000 users. That's crazy when you consider the amount of uh, you know, population here in Malta. We represent 15% of the addressable market, the adults, 15%. And we launched in September. Um, so the product itself, you get a very cool product. So the security, I know that you are all interested about online security. And you can get all the, the security that you might expect from a fintech company through Revolut. My favorite one is the location-based security. So if you misplace your, uh, your card and you, are, you, know, you don't even know it, and somebody finds it and try to make a, a transaction, Revolut will automatically block it. You can also block contactless e-commerce ATM and Magstripe, as you can see. Talking about online security, we also launched the virtual disposable cards, which is particularly interesting when it comes to fighting fraud. Online fraud, according to data, was 1.7 or 1.8 billion euros uh, last year alone, and it, it keeps increasing 10% every single year. Our solution is very neat. So you, you issue a one-time disposable card, and you load the money that you want, and then once you uh, use it, Boom, the card ceases to exist anymore. So no hacker in the world can actually get his or her hands on this virtual disposable card. Uh, we also incentivize our users uh, to use the plastic card more and more so that we can actually go to a cashless society. Um, so this is our solution for, for this to happen. It, we call it the perks. So every time you use the uh, uh, Revolut card, you get a bar. And when you get 10 bars, you unlock uh, a, a perk, which is like an offer. You might get 15% from Amazon or 50% from your next uh, skinny cappuccino latte. So Vols is also a very cool technology that we use for people that uh, want to save money without even noticing. How? Again, with, um, with, um, with the card, every time you use it, we round up to the, the, the transaction to the next integer. So if you buy something like, like a, a coffee, 3.5, it will automatically get 0.50 euros to the vault, and then you start saving without even noticing. Cryptocurrencies, of course, Malta loves uh, crypto. This is the blockchain island, after all. So we offer all our customers from day one uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and Bitcoin Cash. Why Revolut? This is why. There's a sound, but anyway, yeah. Amazing, right? You get everything into one wallet, Revolut. Uh, so what else you, can you do? You can split bills. You can pay people where they are near you, even if you don't have their mobile number or you don't even need their IBAN anymore. Forget about that. Just pay near me. 
uh, spending analytics and budgeting controls, very advanced analytics that can help you on your everyday usage to track you, where you're spending uh, your money and adjust accordingly. Uh, and when you, we are talking about this insane growth, 3.2 million customers, how do we actually support them? Uh, we implement cool AI technology. Rita is our bot that uh, can handle up to 27% of incoming requests every single day. Um, so that's probably why we have such a high rating on, on the App Store, 4.9 out of 5 stars. Our customers are really happy about the service. You can also get worldwide and device insurance, so you can travel with ease and ease of mind. Uh, you can also, also get credit. This is a feature that we offer for our UK customers, but it's coming throughout Europe uh, as well. Premium accounts, if you need more from Revolut, this is how you do it. It's a subscription-based uh, plan that you get all the, uh, the benefits that is listed on the slide. And of course, Revolut Metal, our latest product. We are really proud about it. Uh, it can give you up to 1% cashback on your everyday transaction. Anywhere you go, up to 1% cashback straight to crypto. How cool is that? You can also get $600 uh, dollars or euros or pounds uh, per month for your ATM allowance to, to withdraw money. You get all free worldwide travel insurance and also a dedicated concierge. What's next? Commission-free trading platform. We're going to rev revolutionize investments as well so, th so that anybody that has Revolut can buy shares listed on New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. You like Facebook and you want to, to invest on what Mark Zuckerberg is doing? You just press a button, boom, you have a serve by Facebook. Revolut Wealth, if you want to invest in um, you know, our products that are more kind of packaged, you can also do that. Airport lounges, this is, this is very cool for people that travel a lot. And from what you can understand, Revolut is all about your global lifestyle app. So this can give you access to all these amazing lounges so you can relax and travel with uh, ease. This is our expansion plan. We are Actually, we just uh, announced today that we got the license in Singapore and Japan and the other countries listed on the slide. These are all coming up for launch in 2019. So our plan is to become the biggest financial organization in the world, targeting 100 million users in the next five years. Acquiring is a big part of it. Um, and we also offer Revolut business accounts for uh, all the companies out there that need to get a fast uh, corporate account. Everything happens online, so you don't have to visit any, uh, any bank store anymore. Uh, and you can also connect with, uh, with, with integrated technology, with Slack and other uh, technologies using Revolut Connect. And of course, use the API to do even more stuff like loyalty for your customers. I think this is very important. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much, and I enjoyed the show. Understanding cryptocurrency payments. There is a clear move towards a digitized payments world. How do crypto payments compare to traditional methods? Can decentralized payment systems integrate with the current online gaming model? Patrick Kadletz, BitBay Pay. Again, again uh, on the stage, uh, so very stressful day for me, but uh, yeah, so I wanted to introduce uh, our pro product uh, uh, and uh, BitBay Pay. Yeah? What it is, uh, how you can use it with your, your services, and especially in iGaming. Okay, so imagine there is a gym. Uh, for, for Two years ago, uh, Jim had uh, uh, credit, credit cards, co uh, coins, and other, other uh, methods of the payment. 
And right now, in 2017, he joined the uh, crypto, crypto com community. So what we do? We actually are uh, providing a, a gateway, gateway to uh, Jim, uh, so, so Jim can do pay, pay uh, with his uh, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, in uh, e-commerce, also in the retail. So this is uh, uh, how 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 uh, this is a top three three uh, sorry four uh, uh, currencies that uh, on the top of the uh, CoinMarketCap. cap, but we uh, have uh, about 28 uh, currencies that you you can ex ex uh, um, accept in your on your uh, casinos sites e-commerce sites. Uh, so, what is, the, what is the reason to have the, the crypto payments? So, there is a very low cost, uh, low cost of uh, transfers, so globally, this is one, one thing, comparing to fiat, fiat uh, currencies. Uh, so, I can peer-to-peer -to, -peer to, to, to any, any uh, per, uh, person in the world, yeah, so it's another benefit uh, yeah and it's just fa uh, fast and simple especially for the for the uh, uh, e-commerce or uh, or uh, casinos yeah uh, you as a, as a merchant or as a, as a, as a operators of, of, the, of the casinos and the e-commerce uh, sites you have very good uh, Inside of, of, of this uh, of this product to get uh, get, get the uh, to be independent from from the bank. This is one thing. Secondly, uh, the cryptocurrency costs. So when you com compare it to the uh, bank transfers or you do uh, credit cards, uh, when you compare it with the cryptocurrency. It's uh, you can um, minimize it from uh, almost zero. Yeah. So this is this is something uh, should should be should be interesting for for you. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the fraud, fraud uh, in the in in our system is uh, something that, that you 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 have you you get you don't get. Yeah. So like with the uh, with the cards, for example. Yeah. So once the, 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 the transaction is done, uh, money is yours. Okay. So uh, a few words about the Bitway Pay. So for for now we have uh, 10,000 merchants worldwide. Uh, we uh, uh, operate uh, si since uh, two two, uh, <laughs> two <coughs> sorry uh, uh, two uh, sixteen. Uh, we have an application for uh, for our uh, our exchange, which is a, a part of the uh, ecosystem. Uh, yeah. So how how it works? So we have multi currency uh, wallet. Users, uh, you place the, the widget on your site. Uh, there are, there are, um, uh, for example, Bitcoin. You you just uh, uh, display the the amount that you want to uh, receive. So if you have uh, your 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 wall, your your, mm, uh, your site, uh, uh, and we uh, you accepting bitcoins, not not necessarily you need to uh, have it with, with your, your on your system, yeah? Because we can transfer the money to uh, to uh, to your your system just fiat. So if you want to accept uh, 200 euros, you 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 will get. 200 years. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, uh, m many many things about uh, about the uh, two, two uh, factor authentication plugins to to different s s sites, uh, and we will be issuing a bit bit by card, so uh, your users can can uh, top up uh, cards. Uh, so it's uh, it's for depo de depo deposits. Sorry. And also for the withdrawal. Yeah. So uh, if I can ask for.
Det er bra. Uh, we, this is how, how, the, how the transaction looks like. Uh, this is flow. It's very, very simple. Uh, this is a, a panel of the merchant. Also, we, we can uh, integrate with the API. So if you have uh, your, your uh, pay payment processing uh, in, uh, in, uh, in your, uh, on the system, we can integrate it in, in, into that directly. Yeah, and the good thing is uh, we are fiat, yeah? So, so uh, this, this, is, this is something that um, not, not many uh, providers of uh, cryptocurrencies has. Yeah, so thank you very much. Cryptocurrency versus fiat payment solutions. The unbanked are increasingly relying on crypto payment solutions. This panel will discuss the opportunities and challenges faced by emerging markets in relation to their financial woes. Gerald Fennec, Forbes, Wesley Elul, Quizando, Jimmy Zhao, ZBX. Moron Barber, Coinpoint, Patrick Cadlets, BitBay Pay, moderated by Monty Munford, Forbes. How are you? So you from BitBay? Yeah. yeah. I went to your booth today, but <laughs> nobody knew only one of the girls. Only girl. Yeah. Ah. Morning. How I are you? Later. Yeah. How are you? Jesus. Yeah. Come on. How are you? Woo. Yes. Thank That's you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this subject to talk about. This gentleman's just been on stage, so we're going yeah, to leave I'm him till last, so you can chillax for a few minutes. <laughs> um, introduce yourselves, please, in uh, descendant order, starting with you, Gerard, about yourself. Um, 45 seconds, maybe, and then we'll get chatting. All right, um, I'm a journalist, uh, focusing on blockchain, cryptocurrency, contributing for Forbes, doing some work for Blocks Live TV, also, other work even for Sigma and Malta Blockchain Summit. That's basically it. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Wesley Alul from Quizando, um, and I've been in the blockchain space for about a year. I've been uh, heavily promoting Malta as uh, our blockchain, little, our little blockchain island, and helping a lot of people in the international scene know the opportunities Malta has to offer. And you won a prize yesterday, right? Yes, I, I was the, the winner yesterday, so the, or my team was rather. Did you no. celebrate that? <laughs> Sorry. Did you celebrate that? Uh, brief, briefly, because I have to be here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Jimmy, please. Okay, uh, my name is Jimmy. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been working in the blockchain space since early 2017. We have done a lot of stuff, like including fund, ICO, uh, exchange. Now I've really focused on exchange side. So uh, we migrate our, one of our biggest exchange in Asia, uh, ZB.com, here in, in Malta. Uh, that's, we are fully, we want to be fully regulated in, under uh, Maltese uh, regulation. So now I'm the CMO uh, for the ZBX, it's an upcoming exchange. Yeah. Good, we had a good conversation yesterday, welcome back. Thank you. Oron? Um, hi, my name is Oron, I'm from CoinPoint, uh, which is an education and marketing agency in the crypto space. Uh, we started 2000, end of 2012 actually, back in Asia, today we have uh, another office in uh, Europe. We are really focusing on trying to educate and trying to explain uh, everything in the blockchain space, payments uh, more into, uh, more focus, I guess, into payments. Okay, thank you. Quick one, maybe. Quick, yeah, so apart from uh, BitBay Pay, we, I'm, I'm also representing uh, BitBay Exchange. Uh, so this is why I'm here, because Fiat, we will dis discuss it. Uh, so we are blessing Malta. So well, welcome. Yeah. And um, great speech, by the way. Uh, no. Round of applause, okay. I think. 
Give me some confidence, bro. Yeah. Um, Ron, I'm going to start with you because you were the most passionate backstage about what you thought about payments. Um, and you were talking more, not so much about crypto v fiat, but uh, in relevance to this conference mm. and gaming. It'd be nice to hear about your thoughts on that, what you could share them. So I, I'm in guy gaming uh, for 14 or 15 years already, uh, and I was lucky enough to be in a very uh, um, strategic place called Manila, Philippines, uh, six years ago when I heard about uh, Bitcoin for the first time. And immediately I saw the advantages of Bitcoin uh, as a payment solution uh, for the iGaming space back there, back then. Ever since, of course, everything that happened and today uh, you go out to Sigma, um, I don't know, 20, 25 percent of the, of the people that you talk to already know something about cryptocurrency and how they can implement it and so on. Um, we just need to remember that uh, uh, Bitcoin is the main coin or cryptocurrency. This is one application using the blockchain technologies. This is the payment application of the uh, blockchain technology, uh, which is very nice and very useful for, uh, for the gaming market. But blockchain can offer much more. Uh, such as? Such as uh, solving problems in terms of a user database, in terms of hosting, in terms of probably fair, mm -hmm. fairness games in terms of uh, marketing, in terms of uh, acquisition and uh, uh, retention channels and so on and so on. It's a very early beginning, uh, but I think that once the Bitcoin like, opened the door for the blockchain technology and people saw that it's, yes, absolutely. maybe it's complicated, but it's working, the next, the next will follow. Interesting. You, sir, were not in your head. Were you agreeing? Oh, yes. I, I was agreeing that the entire crypto technology, uh, well, the blockchain technology is a, is a, is a great underlying thing. I, I was wondering what you meant by how it can help with marketing, though. Um, so <laughs> marketing channels, so the way that you market or the way that you look for your audience for iGaming brand, okay. for example, uh, you know, you can go to Facebook and run a campaign. It's very nice and it's working, mm -hmm. but it's more into branding and exposure and so on. If you really look for the guys, if you look, look, look for the audience that are using crypto in your daily life, okay. they will convert better through decentralized social networks, for example, okay. and not through Facebook. Oh, no, okay. I, no, but, but what, I, what I was also thinking about at that time is the one, one thing with these, uh, the, the blockchain is that it gives that element of trust to a player. I've got a, a point of protocol here. Okay. I, I write for The Economist. Uh, my editor there, Tom Standage, is a, an awesome hum human being. The use of the pronoun, the blockchain, only refers to Bitcoin, according Fair to The Economist. <laughs> okay. Anything else is just called blockchain. Okay. I hate to be rude, but I'm Fair. a pedant, I'm an ex-sub-editor, and it's very important to me. No problem at all. <laughs> so the use of blockchain technology. Blockchain, not the blockchain. Blockchain, blockchain. technology. <laughs> um, uh, over there, it, it, can, it just helps with trust. I, don't, I, I, mean, I imagine many people here have bet online. The odds that you got at that one point of bet, when you've gone in, did you record it anywhere else? Did you take a screenshot of, okay, I got it at uh, a five to one odd? And later on in the day, when you got the results that it was five to one, you just assumed that it's, it is exactly what it was before. With blockchain, we don't have to make that assumption because it's written. You can literally go back and check on the blocks over there. So, so this element of transparency uh, opens up a, a lot of trust to players. You don't have to trust a third party. It's an interesting thing when you're talking about, well, racehorses or gambling in the UK. I think it was in the 17th century, there were three horses, three Arabian horses that came to the UK. They were much faster than old British horses. And the whole of the UK horse racing industry and the whole of the bloodstock industry is based on those three horses, right? To the extent that someone will pay $2 million for a one-year-old horse or a yearling that has never, ever run, oh, wow. ever. So you have like a family tree, like humanity, from those three horses, you have almost a blockchain. Mm -hmm. to, people will spend millions on a horse that's never run. A lot of them don't run very well at all. Okay. But that basis of trust mm -hmm. and that people believe in it so much, it's like humanity. That's it. You know what I mean? You know your mum and dad, and you know you might, well, most people do, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but it's, it's a form of, it's not so much value, but, but trust. So if we wanted to kind of get back on topic and talk about the unbanked. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure if I agree with that statement. The unbanked are increasingly relying on crypto payment solutions. 
Jimmy, uh, what I, do you think? I actually uh, sort of agree with this. Uh, you do? There's a reason behind this, because uh, one of the companies we invest early on called Pondix. Uh, it's actually uh, these guys uh, based in Indonesia, they create a sort of post machines. So the post machines basically help you to directly do the, you can, you can consume your Bitcoin, basically. Like they right. deploy the post machines uh, all over the retail stores, so people can go there and pay. They realized, what we realized, the, the, the head of marketing actually came to uh, Malta. We had a meeting a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, I was asking the basic questions like, why don't you come to Europe and do it? He said, that's not our folks market. We're going to Venezuela, we're going to uh, Africa, and we're going to the rural area of Indonesia. That's the adoption, real adoption. They actually spend all their... All because their, because people are unbanked? They yeah, because people are unbanked, because they have no other solutions, because it's so easy for them to use their solution. It basically, you download the app, then you start, you, can, you basically have a, already have a bank. Uh, all the cryptocurrencies, they help you to deploy it, so you can start using it. Yeah, I mean, I've written about crypto in Africa a little bit. Yeah. Ger Gerard, have, have you written about this in emerging economies? Well, do, do you agree with Jimmy and the statement above? Well, uh, the, the major problem for millions of people is the difficulty of actually getting a bank account. So it's becoming impossible even for big companies to get a bank account. So uh, can you imagine what it's like for people in Africa, South America, Asia, in remote locations? Remote Technology is changing, so they, in Venezuela, they're actually, Dash has actually introduced a system where you can transfer money, use crypto through, through a mobile phone system. You don't even need the internet. Exactly. So these new, these new technologies, which these people don't have access to cash, don't have access to, uh, to, to a bank account to, to operate, their, their economy is completely gone, gone down. No, I think I, I get that, and I get what Jimmy was saying, don't take it to Europe, because sometimes these former platforms yeah. don't work. I mean, you look at the example in Pesa, mm -hmm. I think it was the 10th anniversary this year, yeah. uh, started off as a pilot scheme for Safaricom, I think, mm -hmm. and now it handles something like 44% of Kenya's gross domestic products, right? It's amazing in one way, and in another way, it's a little bit of a monopoly nowadays, yeah. so it's not mm -hmm. a happy 10th anniversary. So there are ways of the unbanked using M-Pesa and crypto to a certain extent. But, but, but I would also, I mean, I'll come back to you, sir, on this one, is that the unbanked just doesn't mean emerging economies. There's the unbanked in London and the unbanked in the UK. In more, now, because they can't get, because of the criteria that they're based on, whether it's your A, I mean, I'm 57, I can't get a mortgage and to, uh, for only 13 years. You know, it's absolute bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to live forever. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 that, but that's a different form of criteria when it comes to the unbanked. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, I, I, I have uh, uh, experience in, we, we uh, originated from, from Poland, yeah? So the, the, the country is very, uh, there's a lot of banks and the technology behind those banks. Uh, and uh, when we launched the, the exchange, uh, it seems uh, for us, it was very uh, shocking that a lot of people are over 18 years old they want they, they want not to uh, uh, put the money into into banks. They want to uh, do the crypto. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's uh, one thing. So so uh, uh, I'm t t totally uh, uh, with the line uh, Africa, uh, Asia, and and you know uh, Latam. Yeah, that's uh, un under underbanked uh, uh, regions. But uh, we 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 see it uh, in the, in the, in the Poland. That you know, uh, one, uh, almost one million users we have, yeah. uh, uh, and they, they don't want to go to the, to the bank, yeah, because is that because the demographic is younger? It's like a millennial snowflake mm, thing. We we, not, we don't know because you know the, the, we have 80s of 55 uh, because the system was was created in a way that you you can uh, entry. Uh, very very fast, yeah. So 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 the, so we we believe that uh, uh, the crypto will be. Uh, you do believe it, yeah. Aron? Israeli? Yes. I worked on a moshav in Israel. Say again. I, I worked on a moshav. Okay. On the uh, on the West Bank in show, 1984. Show me your fingers. Show me your fingers. Uh, they're 
they're a bit more less, but I picked grapes, <laughs> I, extraordinary thing. But at that time, um, when I got paid every month with the shekel, I had to go to Beersheva as soon as I got paid because the shekel at that time was, was losing value all the time. So using that as a very weird example of the kind of, I don't know, the deflationary element of fiat currency. Did, would you, would, do you think that fiat currency is over or crypto will take it over? I mean, the, I mean, the shekel now, I presume, is quite stable, right? I have no idea. Um, I don't live in Israel in the last uh, six and a half years, but uh, I, I, will I, will, I will answer your question basic, b based on, on uh, my, my friend's uh, uh, comment about young generation and high technology, uh, innovative uh, third generation using mobile phones and so on. So one example from the Philippines, for example, which is one of the biggest uh, countries in terms of adoption for cryptocurrency. And you've been there for six years, right? Yes. Without them knowing that they're using Bitcoin. Okay, so there are 100 million Filipinos in the Philippines and 20 million others walk in abroad and the biggest market is based on remittance. This is the, the most yeah. uh, 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 valuable market for cryptocurrency. So this family that's living in the province, they are unbanked. Not because they decided to be cryptocurrency related, because they don't have bank in the village and they Absolutely. don't have a car, they have nothing. Mm -hmm. The only thing that they have is a, a very old Nokia 6120 not even third generation, and uh, the money that uh, their uh, family member walking in Saudi Arabia sending is being sent these days through cryptocurrencies, which really? means it's faster, which means it's cheaper. Hey, hey, so, so explain that to me. I understand the remittance element, yeah. the old school Western Union. I mean, I've, been, I've used the Hobbs Hill when I was hitchhiking in Ethiopia a few years ago, I understand. Mm -hmm. But they send their payments back in crypto. Yeah, so the, the constructor that deployed 20,000 or 30,000 Filipinos in Saudi Arabia to build the stadium for the next World Cup, for example, he sent the money back to the Philippines or Laos or Indonesia and so on. And the money is being sent through cryptocurrencies and it goes uh, with the local exchanges, it goes to the mobile phone account of his this employee's I did, mother. I did not know that. She pays in this grocery store, again, somewhere in the province, she pays with the, with the mobile phone. So when you say unbanked, Yes, cryptocurrency is interrupting technology and uh, all the banks in Poland or in, the, in Europe, they don't really like it because it's taking market share. Uh, but there are a lot of territories when unbanked means that people don't have other solutions. And the blockchain technology is helping them yeah, no, to absolutely. receive yeah, no, these that. funds without even them knowing that they're using because they don't really know, need to know that it's Bitcoin involved. Do you think there needs to be a form... Actually, I'll move on from you. I'm sorry. No, I, can't, I want to come back to the Philippines. Um, I would speak to you, sir, about it. But do you think that there's a lack of education here about how many places you can spend cryptocurrencies? Well, that, that's for sure. Well, I mean, you can, you can use it on airlines. Yep. You can use it all over the place. I, but I, everyone seems to think it's just drug dealers and terrorists. Well, that's what popular media was spinning oh. all 2016, Sick 17. Sick to death of that bullshit, it's, man. I mean, what are they saying? It's, oh, it's completely anonymous. You can never know, you can never know. They're just throwing all this, this FUD about a cryptocurrency, that it's just something for the bad guys to play with. But it's really not. Uh, when, you, when you were going back before about the unbanked, it reminds me of a story when I was studying in France. Yeah. Uh, back then, Malta wasn't part of the EU. So getting money out of Malta and into France was a bit of a hassle. And I remember going over for my first couple of weeks in college over there. And how, did, how could I get money over? I had to get money over in my pocket in cash. That was the only way to, to travel that money over. So flew over, got to uh, Charles de Gaulle, walked out of the airport, went to go get my taxi. My money was gone. Oh, no way. My money was completely gone. And uh, someone, someone had, had pinched it within uh, literally minutes of me being actually at the airport. <laughs> That's the French for you. No. Yeah, but that's it. That's exactly Sorry, it. Sorry, it's, it's a joke. Uh, no, but, um, but when, when, I was, when I was over there, had I had this sort of solution, uh, a crypto payment solution for, remember, we're in the EU, so we, we pass payments very quickly around things these days. Credit cards are quite easy to get. When I was in France, it was a little bit harder for me to get a bank account, being a foreign student there. Yeah, sure. So all of, the, all of these uh, things that we think of, for the EU payments, so why we need banks. No, we just need a way to pay. And yeah. that's, what, that's what crypto is giving us. Crypto is giving us the option to pay all around the world in a currency that can work. So, so, yeah, so, so I mean, Ron, I want to talk to you about this. But the, the process of doing that with now, it's a public key, private key yeah. area. It's nothing more, nothing more complicated than that. It's like, uh, I'm working in Saudi, 
I've got $300, I'm sending it back to the Philippines, public key, private key. Is that how it's done? No. No, no so tell me how it's done, because I don't get it. Um, technically point of view, I yeah. cannot explain how it works, but I know that, again, this family that is looking for the money for living, getting the money into the uh, phone account, where they can use it and consume with this, with this but balance. It's, but it's transferred into fiat when it arrives on their phone? Yes. Right, okay. With the local exchanges, Okay, so I get it yeah, now. With okay. the local exchanges, yes. All right. Okay. But, but this is a good example of going to France, because uh, I came uh, from uh, Bulgaria here to Malta, and I had in one pocket my leva for the taxi in, uh, in Bulgaria, and in my other pocket I have my euro for Malta. W why do I need this hassle? Why can't I, can I just... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My QR code, absolutely. that's it. Uh, Jimmy. I think the use case for cryptocurrency applies very heavily on a cross-border payment. I think it's already happening. Let's, let's face it, like how much money has been transferred cross-border. Because uh, within the same system, let's say in China, uh, people have WeChat and Alipay. It's like 90% 90, 90 of the market share. At daily basis, you have a problem, WeChat or Alipay, which one to pay? <laughs> so, so, but well, that's within the whole system in, in, inside China. Like if, if you want to transfer money outside China, every single uh, citizen can only have 50,000 uh, US dollar per yeah. year. So yeah, that's yeah. like a very harsh limit. I read something very interesting about how the Chinese are getting their money out of China. Yeah. So cryptocurrencies... You know, do you know what it was? Yeah. Sperm. Sperm. They were transporting their sperm out of China, impregnating <laughs> into Japan, <laughs> impregnating a woman or paying a woman to impregnate her so they have a son or a daughter in Japan then they're allowed to put money into a trust fund. <laughs> so there are ways around it. I'm not saying that sperm <laughs> is going to take over. Well, cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency is much simpler, right? So. <laughs> you know. Biocurrency. It's, it solves some pinpoint there. So Probably takes a bit longer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and another point is also, when you think about unbank, actually it happens these days too. You could, you could come from bank, become unbanked. Because simple, look at last year, Chinese government cracking down the cold cryptocurrency things. A lot of guys, the bank got frozen, right? So like, you, suddenly you, you realize your money is not your money. Yeah. It's, um, government can shut it down. Like, just, just it's, like it's, it's interesting, I think, as well, that, that, uh, how contactless has changed things completely. Yeah. I was, there was a guy earlier on, on Stockholm who was encouraging people to um, leave London and go to Stockholm. I've got an opinion about that because London's the best city <laughs> in the world. But I went to a, a deli just to get a sandwich and a coffee in Stockholm. And they said, we don't accept cash. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, how quickly has this happened? It's already happened, yeah. I spoke to a guy, a barman in London last week, two weeks ago, I was going to the football or something. And I said, what percentage now? Because I went, I've got cash, serve me now, ho, ho, ho. 85% is, mm -hmm. is contactless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that seems to have happened in such an accelerated m manner that, that, that it seems that maybe fear is getting its act together, you know realizes the threat from crypto, stories that you've said are on, and stories that you agree with. Um, do you think that maybe fear is becoming more intelligent, more smart, and it will make a recovery? Gerard, you haven't spoken for a while. <laughs> well, I, I don't really know what to say about that, but um, what, what I can say is that I don't think we're using any, any, any really actual of the potential of cryptocurrencies we've spoken about yeah. the technological features how you can the speed of payments and all that and um, for example here in Malta we, we could have an easily have a, a great test case for example use like St. Julian Slima that 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 area like all the shops would come into an agreement to accept you know like a stable coin for example to pay in crypto and then if you want you can switch it the the merchant can switch it over to to, to any other fiat, so there are lots, there are lots, there's lots of potential with crypto, but it's not being, it's not being tapped into mostly. Do you, do you think that's, that's because it's perceived to be slow? Say, so, say so if you want to cash out on crypto, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I did some off the record. Uh, I took some money out last January, and it took me like three weeks mm -hmm. to get my money. It's you think is, is that type of thing going to stop? the adoption of crypto as a general means of currency. Well, there is that fear, you know, that, that your money isn't safe. This kind of this fear that it takes you a long time like to switch it on certain exchanges or s most of the exchanges are just crypto to crypto. So 
you have to find a way to, or a platform. But, yeah, but to your point, is that stopping the potential? Yeah. The, the, anything that's, else? That's part, of, that's part of the problem. We have a, challenges is another thing here. What else, what other challenges do you think there are? Uh, well, uh, at the moment, I'd say, it's, I'd say it's the price. And people have lost a lot of money. I mean, if they actually cashed out because they panicked. Um, we've seen like regulatory issues. It's, it's a mix and match of things, but this year has been terrible. So mm -hmm. hopefully we're getting kind of getting out of it. But there's, there's been a, an assault on, on, on the crypto industry. You, you think there's year. been an assault? Yeah, I think it's yeah, a, I think a, a concerted assault by the big players, the big. Yeah, big I, think, investors, I, think we were big I think we were expecting that, right? Yeah. What do you think next year? I think I think the the adap adaption yeah in the e-commerce and retail this is this is key yeah, because uh, I might be uh, holding the money uh, in crypto or in fiat yeah but uh, if I'm able to really go to any any place for it's a casino is a, is a, a bike shop or or a restaurant then it, it becomes to really uh, you know, global thing, yeah? And right now it's uh, more uh, remittances. This is one thing, uh, speculation uh, also. Uh, so, so this, this is the, uh, where I'm... I'm, I'm I, think, uh, I think the speculation yeah. has kind of ruined it a bit. Yeah, yeah, so, so right now there is uh, uh, places where I can really go and pay with the, with the Bitcoins or other, 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 other the, uh, currencies. Yeah. I've read that, <coughs> excuse me, that Amazon was doing something with Ethereum, so you could pay with Ethereum. When, I mean, yes. that, I think, that's some me, so it's like, that, that would be the explosion. And actually, actually, uh, we are delivering the solution for a company called G2A.com. This is like an eBay, but for games. Yeah, so, right. and they, they, uh, they have really m massive adoption of, 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 of this solution uh, uh, on the cons consumer, uh, uh, but also the merchants. Merchants also want to uh, keep uh, tr tr uh, transfer the money uh, they collect in fiat yeah. into crypto to make. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So as this consumer, we should have the option: How would you like to pay? Yeah. Mastercard, yeah, exactly. Visa card, Bitcoin, yeah. Ether. Bitcoin, Ether. Yeah. How far away are we from that, Gerard? Well, we're very far away because no major merchant online accepts crypto. So you mentioned Amazon. I, I haven't seen any, any major merchant which. Access crypto. So you think it's a long way? You? I, I think until we have a, we're going to need some form of stable coin mm -hmm. or, or fiat currency underlying always. Yeah. The adoption of payment through it is once there's trust back in the market. So the speculation is. Yeah, you, I you mean, mentioned, you, you, you mentioned like 2019. I think 2019 will, will be the year of stable coins, you know? We're seeing the mushrooming. Fair enough. You think that as well? I, I, I think in 2019, we're going to see a, a little bit of uh, stability in the market growth, but not what is $10 today is worth 8 tomorrow and 15 the next day. Yeah, no, no. It's, that, That's always going to be an issue of value, and uh, why would I part with that? Do you think the volatility is going to stop? The volatility, I, I think there will be a point where it'll stop. I think it'll reach a plateau, and that it will find its natural value. Every, every item in every market finds a natural value. And it might increase year by year, but it, I think it'll be marginal once it hits that point. Jimmy, agree with that? Uh, I think, yeah, from retail side, it's, yeah, I still don't see a massive adoption. Yet, but uh, from my own experiences, we already started using a lot of cryptocurrency internally, like for yeah. to pay services to cross-border payment. Like, for yeah. example, we pay our developers in China directly with Bitcoin. They're yeah. happy with that. that. You do that? Yeah, we do mm -hmm. that. Already doing that. We, we in recently, for example, our a million dollar investment through Bitcoin. No, so, interesting. Yeah, we so. should talk about that. <laughs> Oron, you agree? The question again? 2019. Okay. It'll be a year of... So, uh, uh it looks very similar to what happened in 2013 and beginning of 14. So the graph look, looks the same. I totally believe that uh, you know Bitcoin is low, and if you are very low, the only way that you can go is up, sooner or later. Uh, but in terms of blockchain adoption, uh, not only Bitcoin. This is totally the year 2019 because the technology is there already. The understanding is much more progress than before. And uh, this year, we're going, next year, we're going to see a lot of uh, implementation into this technology, payment and others, into every, everything that we're doing in our life. And uh, yeah, future basically. So we're, we're basically, we're in the infancy stages. We're about to head into a troubled adolescence 
and then we will all grow up and use crypto. Last question. How much money have you got on you at the moment? Cash. Cash? In your pocket. Oh, I have more uh, money in crypto. To, <laughs> in, in, no, how much have you got? Tw I've got six euros. How about you? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe something like this. Like, yeah, you? Yeah, 20 maybe. <laughs> Don't show me, it's all right. <laughs> so I have uh, like uh, 40 euro, around 100 leva. Okay, Jimmy? Uh, 30. 30. About 60. 60. Oh. So you're buying the beer? <laughs> yeah, you're around. <laughs> <laughs> you were. Gerald, you were a journalist. In my wallet. It's, it's not here, it's in the video. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, we're over time. Um, that was a really awesome conversation. Um, and I hope you got a lot of uh, pleasure and knowledge out of it. I certainly did, not least with the Philippines and paying your developers in China. Thank you very much for a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Paving the way for crypto mass adoption. Ilya Beer. Changely. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ilya Beer. I'm a CEO at uh, Changely. Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, I'm really glad to be here on behalf of uh, Changely team and on behalf of the, uh, the whole crypto community. Uh, so uh, I will talk a bit about our project later on because now I would like to jump right into the uh, crypto mass uh, adoption. Uh, so uh, first of all, can I ask you to raise your hands those who think that crypto mass adoption is already here? Somebody? Okay, <laughs> just the two hands. It's uh, very valuable, actually, feedback, because uh, once uh, I ask these questions on some blockchain uh, conferences, there is like 90% uh, of the uh, hands, uh, hands up. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, let me uh, shed light on the questions, uh, like uh, what is the current state of the uh, cryptocurrency uh, in terms of mass, mass adoption? Uh, what um, projects, cryptocurrencies, and like sectors mostly contribute to the industry mass adoption, and uh, what uh, issues and obstacles we have on the path to um, to the mass uh, adoption? Um, so, uh, to be honest, the like the topic is very extensive and uh, very uh, controversial. Uh, so, I would love to discuss it later on uh, over the beer. Uh, but I will try to uh, make my best to uh, discuss all this uh, in a lot of ten minutes. Uh, uh, yeah, so first of all, is uh, mass adoption already here? Um, indeed, if we like, look at this uh, 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 graph, uh, we see that the number of active uh, Bitcoin addresses has risen hundreds or even a thousand times during uh, like uh, eight, eight years. And uh, uh, many of uh, my colleagues who work on this market uh, for a long time, uh, they all admit if, that if somebody would like uh, ask them, like three, maybe four years ago, uh, if, uh, if, if they knew that the level of the mass adoption would be like it is right now, they would say that that is exactly the uh, mass adoption that everybody in the blockchain industry were dreaming about. Uh, but if we turn to a bit another graph, we would see that uh, uh, in terms of uh, users and uh, user database growth, uh, cryptocurrency is approximately at the level of the web or internet uh, in the 1995. Of course, there was like a bit hype, like it is uh, nowadays in the blockchain, and uh, there was a, lit, uh, a lot of like articles on that, and a lot of people were talking about that. Uh, but uh, we couldn't name it like a mass adoption, and um, at this time, 
to better understand the process of uh, mass adoption, let's switch to so-called uh, technology adoption, uh, or as it also known as a uh, bell curve. Uh, I would say that nowadays we are somewhere between the second and the third phase of the adoption of the blockchain and cryptocurrency technologies. Uh, like the seven years ago, and for a, quite a long time, uh, cryptocurrency was uh, almost the, uh, the field for the innovators. These are the guys who are ready to work with the like, raw technology, and they're like geeks, and they're keen on that. Uh, after that came the stage for the early adopters. These are the guys who would like to uh, think, they think of terms like some revolutionary ca cases, some uh, disruptive, uh, disruptive business models. But if we would like to talk about the mass adoption, that is the guys who are uh, early majority. And these guys would like to work only with some proven cases, with some proven uh, uh, business applications, and with the, like, uh, with, the, with the risks that are not so high as, uh, as it is nowadays. Uh, so on top of uh, lack of proven uh, application and proven cases nowadays, there are also a number of difficulties uh, that are also named uh, very often as an uh, enemies of the mass adoption of cryptocurrency. These are the uh, regulation and uh, volatility of the market. So I assume that uh, like our, uh, our aim, the, the aim of the uh, early, early adopters is uh, to bring and to overcome all this chasm, all these difficulties to, to bring uh, this technology to the uh, early majority to, for example, to the gaming or uh, gambling uh, platforms. Uh, let's start from the regulation. Let's see how it's, how it's going in, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this field. So uh, on, some, on some countries, uh, the mass adoption is going like, beyond the regulation. And uh, the guys here talked a lot about that, that in some countries, like Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Turkey, and some others, uh, more than half of the adult uh, population hold, hold or uh, traded uh, cryptocurrencies. So actually, that's a really, really huge numbers. Uh, but in, if we are talking about like, some gradual growth, if we're talking about some uh, steady and long-term mass adoption, it's always uh, about the regulation. And uh, countries like Malta, like South Korea with the Jeju Island, like Japan, they're doing their best uh, to make uh, these uh, regulations and to, they're working on some cryptocurrencies guidelines in terms of uh, legal, uh, legal field. Uh, in terms of uh, volatility, there is also a number of solutions, and uh, stable coins are named uh, among them. Uh, so in, uh, after the teaser with the uh, USDT, there is a number of uh, competitive projects, and the, uh, the majority uh, of these projects are aimed to help with the, uh, with the, to beat the volatility of the market. And uh, nowadays, there are more than two uh, hundred uh, stable coins projects right now, and we see that more and more customers are utilizing this uh, technology in order to overcome the volatility. Uh, but uh, let's drill down into a bit uh, into the uh, niches for disruption, where the blockchain and cryptocurrency technology could find their their place. Uh, so in uh, nine, in 2017, uh, it was. Uh, trading, that was the cross-border payments. Uh, we see that more and more companies in charity using uh, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies to uh, provide the uh, transparency on their transactions. Uh, but uh, concerning the uh, audience nowadays, uh, just a bit, uh, would like to talk a bit about the gambling and uh, gaming. Uh, there is uh, done a majority of work on this direction. We have such great partners like Bantoy, Vox, and uh, Engine. Uh, 
Uh, these companies are working on implementing blockchain uh, and cryptocurrencies on their work. That's the acceptance of the cryptocurrencies to pay for the, for the games. That's the uh, decentralized uh, platforms for uh, iGaming. That's also like uh, having the uh, gaming assets uh, on some uh, blockchain technologies. So this is very interesting, and might, it, that might be the point of growth and the point of mass adoption uh, in terms of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, just, uh, just a few words about our projects, because uh, at the end of the day, all these like cryptocurrencies, all these like um, utility tokens and security tokens and uh, gaming assets, they all need the place where that could be exchanged to another asset. And uh, the uh, swapping platforms like Changely and like um, others are ready to support that and being the, the middle, middleman to provide the best customers, the best seamless and the best uh, useful customer experience uh, for, the, for the mass adoption. So yeah, we are like the middleman who provides a uh, uh, transaction between the uh, liquidity markets exchanges and between the uh, businesses and like individual uh, customers. So we are here for, the, for uh, three years. Uh, we are incorporated in Malta and we are doing our best to be uh, the swap platform number one uh, in the world. We are looking for the emerging uh, stable coins for emerging security tokens as well as uh, emerging platforms for gaming and we would be uh, glad to uh, have a partnership with all of you. Well, time is up. Thank you very much. We'd we'll be glad to see you on some beer. Thanks, bye. The unbanked. Over 2 billion people still don't have access to a bank account. Blockchain could help create financial alternatives in an efficient, transparent and scalable manner. Know your customer processes could be achieved with a digital identity. Property rights could be moved to the blockchain, allowing them to enter a formal network and leverage their property as collateral. The possibilities are endless. Wesley Elul, Quizando, Vladislav Hvechkovic, Soft Gamings, Theo Goodman, Proof of Work Media, moderated by Monty Munford, Forbes. Nice video. <laughs> Hiya. <laughs> hello. Oh, hello. Hello again. Hello. Sorry about the delay, um, my fault. Um, gentlemen, nice to meet you all. Um, we're going to have a good conversation uh, about banking the unbanked. We've just had a very similar discussion uh, earlier. Um, I forget your first name. Wesley. Wesley. Sorry. Wesley. Uh, and it's yes. Okay. Um, so if we you would just reintroduce yourself, just 30, 40 seconds. Yeah. Um, uh, Wesley Lul from Quizando, and uh, I am uh, currently uh, building a skill game platform for influencers around the world to monetize their audience directly. So people who currently don't have access to online money, this is a way for them to gain access. And I think if there wasn't people here earlier, you won the startup prize yesterday. Yes, yes, we won the ICO pitch yesterday. Good. You can buy me a drink later. Oh. <laughs> Sir, you. 
my name is uh, Vlad Hvetskovic. Uh, I am uh, the CIO of uh, Soap Gamings, and we are actually uh, iGaming platform and uh, the aggregator of content. Uh, we have been around for, um, for more than 10 years now. Wow. And uh, we have started very small, but now uh, we are one of the leading companies in, uh, in that industry. And is that, uh, where are you based? Are you based in Russia? Uh, we are based in uh, Latvia, but we have uh, offices actually here as well, and in Russia, uh, our development office. And that's where, where's your audience across the uh, world? Worldwide, but we are B2B, so uh, we, okay. don't, we don't work with the uh, players themselves. Okay. Theo, please. Uh, I'm Theo Goodman from Proof of Work Media. We're a boutique strategy consulting and design studio, and we help you tell your narrative. And which would be? <laughs> well, that would depend. <laughs> what's, 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 that would be uh, some really dank memes and um, FOMO and FUD, understanding okay. that. Okay. I think I understand. <laughs> okay. There you go. That's why you need us. Absolutely. There totally. Uh, we'll talk later. Uh, um, Bank in the Unbanked, um, how is that relevant to you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I was uh, helping on a project, one of our projects of proof of work called Chama Pesa, and that is a project that. In, so basically, in Africa and other parts of the world, there are social savings circles. You could think of it as an investment group or a community savings group. So people that are not able to get a bank account, they've already organized themselves in small groups. Imagine uh, 5, 10, 20 people, and they all throw into the pot every week, and then if somebody would like a loan, they can get a loan, and it's essentially based on their reputation in the community. So if they were to default, then the people of, in the circle would you know, go to their grandfather and say, hey, you need to get this guy to pay, pay up, and they're risking their reputation. So imagine if you could... Um, use blockchain technology to connect these groups and leverage the power of them instead of being in separate silos. Africa being a huge continent of many countries, which territories are you talking about here? Um, mostly uh, um, Nigeria, um, Kenya are probably the first ones that come to mind, but those social saving circles are all over the world. They're not only in Africa, actually. A lot of countries have histories of that, and they're just different names. Korea, Vietnam, Asia, China. Who was the guy in Bangladesh, the micro payment? Uh, I, Did I he win know. the Nobel I Prize? I ring a bell right now. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Remember that guy? Rashim or something like that? Oh, okay. Um, so, so you're saying that the, the solution for instead of having a platform, it's more like a, 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 a gathering of people yeah. that do deals of each other. Well, essentially, that's already what goes on. I think that um, basically the term um, banking the unbanked is, should be kind of reversed and more how can people become unbanked if they want uh -huh. and, how the un and, how, and how we can move that direction. Because like some of the presentations earlier, does anyone really want to onboard people? Hey, join me. I'm going to charge you fees out yeah. the ass. Join me. I'm going to give you predatory loans. Join yeah. me. I'm going to do all kinds of stuff with your money that you don't want and limit what you do. That's not what, that's not, so it's not really banking the unbanked. It's how people can become unbanked and uh, take power over their money. I think I'm unbanking, slowly but surely. I think I've had a slightly strange life but I always had the same bank account because I figured that it would be of use for my credit score right. or all these archaic true, forms yeah. of measurement. But I'm gradually, uh, it's a very, very smart point actually, I'm gradually unbanking myself. I'm moving into, I mean, I've got a Revolut account, the guy that did the keynote speech earlier. I've got a Curve card that I don't pay when I go across borders. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm pulling myself away from Lloyd's Bank. I, I, they, invited me, they invited me for lunch about two years ago, the first time in 28 years, oh, wow. because I'd written a piece for the BBC saying, meet the new banks of the future, you might even like them. <laughs> ho, ho, strange that you're inviting me for lunch. And they told me some stories and they said, oh, it's so, so crazy, like some people that work for us, you know, they go outside the building and there's a deli and it takes Bitcoin. They take Bitcoin. And I said, well, do you know what happened to me the other day? I put a card into a, a, a cash machine or an ATM uh, and I forgot to pick up my hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. And it took you six weeks mm -hmm. to tell me after you checked all your cameras that I couldn't have my hundred pounds. 
You should have just given me the money. Yeah. None of this rubbish. And I agree with you. We could go on to a different side of it. Unbanking yourself from traditional banking right. is picking up speed. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think of that? Uh, actually, uh, you asked before uh, the question uh, how, how we feel about the topic itself. And uh, although I'm now in the iGaming industry, I worked uh, in banking industry for 15 years. Oh, did you? So this is actually my first industry. <laughs> uh, and uh, the topic is very interesting to me because... Uh, I think at the moment everybody is unbanked, basically. Uh, the reason uh, is that uh, none of the people are actually uh, ready to say that the bank covers all their needs, and uh, any any bank, yeah. And uh, usually you have uh, uh, like a set of uh, companies that uh, fulfill those needs, and usually you are not happy with all of them, yeah. And uh, I come from Eastern Europe, uh, and uh, in Eastern Europe, the banks themselves, uh, they are not, uh, you know, they don't have 100 years of history. And uh, uh, to some extent, it's, uh, it's a blessing, because when they started, uh, they started after the collapse of the Soviet Union, so they needed to do everything from scratch. Absolutely. There were no checkbooks, for example, <laughs> never were. And, uh, no, no, yeah, yeah. no checkbooks? No checkbooks at all. Never? Ever. Never. In the never. Soviet Union? Never, of course. <laughs> I, I'm writing that down. <laughs> yes. So uh, it's interesting stuff, yeah. And uh, when, when they started, uh, we already got uh, the ATM machines straight away. So we wouldn't uh, have, for example, credit cards without, uh, uh, without uh, uh, the possibility to do the transactions online. So all this stuff already started. We had uh, introduced the IT systems, which were not, you know, like uh, big, huge mainframes uh, with old uh, languages. Everything started quite new. And at the same time, uh, now, uh, there is still an issue with the banks, and the reason for that is the regulation. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge issue for the banks, and they, they are not able to solve it, because uh, basically it's the governments that say that uh, you, are you are allowed to do this or you're not allowed to do that. It's becoming very complex, not because banks like it, but because they are told to do it. Uh, with the penalties, with, uh, with, with the way things are moving, uh, and with the spotlights on them. So everybody is actually moving and creating something just around the corner, which is not called the bank, yeah. but it's, uh, it's doing the same stuff, but it's not regulated. Yeah. And because it's not regulated, they get huge amount of business. So, so did you bring checkbooks into Latvia? Or did you say, forget that, we won't do it? No, no, it's, uh, there is no sense to do checkbooks in Latvia. Yeah. You shouldn't introduce them. Yeah? Uh, if somebody tries to introduce it, it's, it's an old technology. It's like, yeah. you know, like uh, saying that let's do horse riding uh, instead of cars. Yeah? No, no. <laughs> well, I have to say, my wife still uses checks and thinks she's uh, the only person in the world <laughs> that writes down in the back of the checkbook, you know, so... Old habits die hard. So, so in, in this, literally 15 years in Latvian banking, right? Yes. So, so you, you must have an extraordinary story then to tell, apart from what you just said. So you, 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 you're building it up from scratch, as you said, unlike the Bank of England, which is yeah. the second, I think the Danish bank's the yes. oldest bank in the world, I think. I think the Bank of England is second, you know. God knows what's going to happen to the pound over the next 12 months, but that's probably a, <laughs> another story. Um, so, so in those 15 years, I mean, how did you, how did you do it? What did you, what did you focus on? But did, did, you did, did, did you have new digital systems? I mean, I know we have like, old traditional banking is suffering from old COBOL systems and all that. Did you come in straight with a kind of, almost like a cloud perspective or... It depends. Uh, actually, uh, the way uh, the, the banks started in, uh, in Latvia, they did everything from scratch, actually, themselves. Right. So I know uh, the guy who was uh, one of the developers uh, of a banking system uh, for the bank that I worked uh, with when I was 22 years old. And that guy, he didn't have, for example, you know, like a manual how to build a banking system. They needed to do everything uh, on their own. And uh, for a long time, they have been using that system themselves, and uh, they have been uh, optimizing it and so on. Afterwards, of course, they introduced a, a banking system uh, from, uh, like, Equation, uh, and uh, they paid lots right. of millions for it. Uh, but at the same time, when they did it, uh, they didn't have to uh, have these problems of many legacy systems. Yeah, that's, that's, what I was, that's what I meant to say, yeah, yeah. 
because when I worked, uh, I worked in uh, G Money Bank as well uh, in Latvia, and uh, they, the CIO of uh, G Money Bank, they, he told uh, us that uh, you have the technology stack, and you are required to basically move to the platform which uh, all the countries in G Money family uses. And uh, for us, it was very expensive, yeah, and absolutely. we thought. It's, it's not a good option for the country, for, for us as a country, but of course it's a good option for the uh, company as a whole. But when uh, somebody showed me the, uh, the architecture uh, and the infrastructure itself, you know, it, it wouldn't fit on, uh, on a big piece of paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they were buying stuff, you know, they were uh, introducing some stuff, and it's very uh, uh, silo based, yes? Yeah? So yeah. For example, you would get a credit card and you would get a saving account, but it's in different parts of, uh, yeah, of yeah. a system. You, you are not able to say what is the balance of both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, so it's communication. Okay, Wesley. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that you've started a banking system from scratch. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but how would you kind of put yourself in this conversation? Okay, well, from, from my perspective, the first thing I, I have when you think of the bank, why, why did a bank exist? A bank existed so a robber can come into your house and steal that money you've been saving up, which is under your pillow. So it was a nice, safe place to put your money. Um, and when you need it, you can go ask them for it and take it out and they'll charge you a small fee for it. That, that, was, that was most likely the original reason why we had banks, just for safety and security. Absolutely. Right? So what is banking the unbanked? Now, we're giving them an option where they can store their money, but instead of being on a third party person, it's stored in a wallet which could be held in their pocket, it could be held with a thumbprint or various different ways. We're giving them an option to actually hold their own money, hold their own savings. Today, I mean, your money in a bank, what does it really mean? It means you're giving them leverage to give out loans and a whole bunch of other things, and oh, yeah. you're really not getting anything back. So things like, like I mean, this uh, the Revolut, for example, this is I'm, I'm using them constantly when it comes down to my, my payments online. Did it take you a t Did it take you time, as Theo was saying, to unbank yourself? Um, was it like I use Revolut once, or, or and then? You no, as, as soon as as soon as I used it, I started I started using that. I I, I found the features in it were a lot quicker for me than using my traditional systems, logging into the bank app or, or whatever. It, the, the notifications gave me, it just gave me an ease of use. So we're talking really here, a movement from traditional banking to online banking to mobile banking. To, to, mo to mobile banking and soon will be your own personal wallet app, whatever it might be, yeah. where I can do those payments. Because now what a bank is doing is it's just helping us facilitate payments between various different parties. Yeah. Um, I, I, I go back about a year ago. Um, I, had a, I have various different businesses here. And last year, I needed some merchandise from a printer. And they sent me an IBAN. Uh, they sent me the name and everything. And I said, OK, no problem. I sent the payment as they had sent it to me. Um, they called me a couple of days later, and they said, the payment hasn't arrived. I was like, OK, I sent this. Here, here's the transaction record. And they said, oh, you sent it to the wrong IBAN. Uh. I, said, what? I said, OK, let me check. And I did actually send it to the IBAN they sent me. They just sent me the wrong IBAN. Uh -huh. So we started an investigation to get the money back. In fact, we found out who it was. We found out the thing. And they said, oh, it's a client of mine. And I said, OK, call, call the client and ask them to sort of send it over to you. Bit of a mistake. And the person wouldn't. Really? No, the person wouldn't. This person here, here in Malta, and he called, and then I called, and then we had a conversation, and then we had to get the banks involved. Now, this was a thousand euro transaction, so nothing yeah. out of this world expensive. But to do that investigation, it opened up, it cost 96 euros. Yeah. So 10% of that value just completely disappeared. Yeah. And the time. And the time. It took two months to get the money back. Well, the person that wouldn't give the money back is clearly a, not a good person. No, not a good person, and I, I really would love to name and shame them, but uh, that's not Well, right you thing. can. <laughs> now's your chance. Please do. <laughs> no, 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 it was, it was, just, it was yeah. just a supplier on this island, and I, 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 thought, I thought it was very unfair of them because that could have done the system, but their, their, their bank had told them, don't. Yeah. And I, I, was, I was telling them, but what do you have to gain from this? The money is going to come out of your account. No, this anyway. is the same as my £100 in the cash point. Exactly. It's ridiculous. It, it, it's an absolute joke. Now, the thing is, we do need banks for certain things. We do need them for loans at the moment. There is currently, like for in Malta, there is no other loan option to buy a house. You have to go through one of the various different banks. Yeah. So that, there is that element. Or mortgage provider. I mean, that is one thing that needs to be disrupted, right? Oh, for sure. I'll give you a personal story. We, my wife and I and five-year-old son, we went to India pretty much on the day of the recession. Okay. When we got to India, we lived on the beach for a year. We lived on the beach for two years. 
I became a Bollywood film star. It's a long story. <laughs> but we left on the day of the recession and everyone said, you know, God, you know, you know you, you're clever. And it was just well, it's luck, really. Do you know what I mean? Um, we sold a house when we were away. We were thinking of staying longer in India. Uh, so we had a 50% a, a deposit for, to, to get a, ha to ha a house mm -hmm. of what we wanted, a decent you know, country house. No one would lend us any money. Mm. No one. Even with this large amount of money as a deposit. Um, where have you been for two years? As if I'd been in fucking prison. You know what I mean? The three of us went to prison together. Mm -hmm. You know, we went and did... My wife works for the UKTI. I earn a big salary. We took a big risk in our life to go and live in a different way, to give our son a different education. And you're telling me now that I'm setting up a business I can't borrow any money off you. Fuck you. I will never talk to you again. I will never borrow money from you ever again. And there are... Sorry about my language, but it does get me very upset. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, but you're seeing a lot, especially in London, you're seeing lots of mortgage disrupt companies where the criteria is not based on the fact that you bank with this country bank for 24 years or you're a great payer and you've never been late it's almost based on your personality mm -hmm. and, and and who you are and what you are and with data what you buy and how you buy and how smart you are I mean do you think Thea that, that, that we might get to a position where we, if we're trying to borrow money we will use a startup that measures us different differently that doesn't go to a credit agency that doesn't go to all these hackneyed and old-fashioned ways of measuring how worthy you are to borrow money. Uh, yeah, I, th I think definitely, um, because you could make more money like that as a lender if you did it, and if it, w it should be more efficient. It should be a much more efficient way to do it. Uh, on the other hand, it could also go more dystopian, where you know you've got yeah. this like profile of everything you've ever bought because everyone is using non-cash payments, and they're like, hey, this is a little weird, we don't like this kind of person. But, I mean, someone I mean, to be step, to, to step, be, yeah, step sorry, up sorry. with a more efficient way to give loans that reduces defaults and uh, is able to, you know, provide loans for high risk, but lower the defaults based on the profile. That to be fair, I think that's probably happening already. It probably is. You Maybe I mean? people don't want to, you know, tell what is going on exactly. You know, the, the, but chi the China's social media score and all <laughs> that stuff. Yeah. All of these episodes. That's the dystopian of, example yeah, yeah. I'm talking about. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, Black, yeah. Black Mirror comes to life, right. Yeah, I mean, I can see your point. You've got two areas here of a libertarian, decentralized world where we don't need a middleman and all that stuff. For the, the other side of it, or it could be quite creepy. It could, it could. But I think, you know, still, you know, person to person or group to person kind of loans um, person. Could, be, yeah. could be a way uh, to do it. Um, Would you see that the, the African examples that you were using earlier, do you think that old kind of old school way of community money, that may make a comeback or is that just well, utopian? What, is, what has value now to us, our online reputation is pretty valuable. I mean, our in-person reputation too. So that is something that could be leveraged uh, maybe to get loans, you know, uh, IOUs essentially. Social media reputation, yeah. Well, it's yeah. social media, it's everything. It's your whole internet reputation, whatever yeah, that is. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I think that could play a big role. I mean, they know you're a moderator, so, and you're on YouTube, so if well, you the, default, then you're... Well, the amount of <laughs> moderation gigs I've been getting <laughs> recently where they give me an iPad <laughs> and they say, ask the questions, I'm done. I mean, I'm over. You know, yeah. I'm a writer, I'm over already. Um, I'd go back to... I go to Tech Chill in Riga every yep. year. I think it's an amazing conference. If you ever go and you want to get, well, if you want to get colder and go to a conference, <laughs> go to Riga in uh, Latvia in February. But I go with Baltic Air. And guess what? I buy my ticket in Bitcoin every time I go. And I think we touched on this earlier, Wesley. You know, this is a lot of, this is about education. You know, what people don't know, where you can spend crypto, how you can spend it. I mean, I learned two things early on the panel. I didn't know, and I'm supposed to know. Well, you're actually just saying where you can buy, what you can do with crypto. In fact, one of my first businesses I started on this island was a business directory. Um, and back then I was trying to solve a problem for Malta that if you Googled something, you'd get Malta, Ohio, Malta, Texas, Malta, New York, but not our, our little island. And I, I did that for an SEO point of view. In fact, now what we had decided, I think it was about three weeks ago, that on our directory, we're actually going to give an option for everybody to say, I accept crypto as just a simple thing of 
who can I pay in crypto? Where can I, where can I take this money and throw it? Absolutely. And, you, and I, I, there's a company, I live in Brighton, near London. There's a company there called, well, it used to be called Pragmatic Web. Okay. They're now called Pragmatic. WordPress industry is amazing, mm -hmm. right? It's a huge industry. And they came up with providing the crypto button. Okay. So anyone that's got a website that's based on WordPress has a crypto button. Mm -hmm. Simple. And the, the company is going to be a huge company, I think, in the future. They're very impressive anyway. But again, that's just education as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like, how do I do this? What, what, what should I do? But one of the things that we spoke about earlier was that how fiat currencies were getting their act together. Mm -hmm. You know, contactless has become huge. You know, I think Sweden, it's like 95%. I, I would imagine, sir, that Riga would probably, it would probably be one of the earlier yeah, yeah, cashless yeah. societies. But then that's got really unfortunate consequences as well. So if you're, if you're a homeless Swedish person, I mean, you can't exactly accept payment on the street from a, a phone, can you? So you have societal kind of upheavals in, in that respect. So... Would you say you're an optimist about the future of money? Be yeah, I definitely I'm an optimist. I, just I, I mean, for the record, I'm a pess optimist. Well, I read yeah. it in a book. Uh, right, so we just have to realize you know, the potential to use these tools, blockchain d definitely being one of them, and smart contracts, they, they're tools. So you could use them in a bad way, just like you can use a hammer to hit someone in the face. It's the, you know, so you could have all kinds of things, assassination markets, uh, <laughs> you know, tracking every payment everyone does. It could get really weird. Mm -hmm. so that doesn't, sound very, that doesn't sound very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm so optimistic that I know that that is a possibility, and I'm optimistic despite so, that. Pragmatics. Yes, pragmatic, you, yeah. could, you could say, yes. What about you, sir? You're an optimist about this? Uh, yes, uh, I think the technology has been moving us forward uh, for many, many years, and uh, what we see now is uh, is a great tool. And uh, actually, the cryptocurrency, I think one of the main reasons it's, uh, it arrived is because people don't trust in the government. Yeah. And uh, we uh, from Eastern Europe, we know that. So you you can live in a place where you don't trust the uh, the guys who are making the decision for a long time. And you've got no <laughs> and you don't have a checkbook either. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you cannot even move out <laughs> if you don't no, like no, it. No, no, absolutely. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that's a big issue. And uh, moving that away uh, from uh, from the state's hands uh, is it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, it allows them uh, the the people basically uh, to say that you are responsible for your actions Absolutely. and you just cannot, you know, print money. And we've been printing money for 10 years. Exactly. Right? I yeah, mean, yeah. that's insane. Exactly. As well. We're coming to the end here, but my pinned tweet uh, on, my, on, on my Twitter is the amount, of time, the amount of time it takes small businesses in the UK to get paid, yeah. right? Whether it's 28 days, mm -hmm. 56 days, I think 90 days is the, is the maximum. And it seems that the bigger the company, the longer they take to pay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've suffered from it for my, 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 myself. I don't put up with it anymore. I make sure that I get paid up front or a proportion of the money is paid up front. And if they say no, it's like, well, I don't want to work with you. you clearly, you don't trust me. And well, you know, see you later. Um, do you think that crypto might be able to change that really rubbish in balance because I think that if everyone was paid on time mm -hmm. for the work that they did then the GDP of the UK would outstrip anything that's going to happen to us after Brexit. Oh yeah. Do you think crypto could help with well, that? Crypto and oh, no, more so much smart, smart contracts. contracts. Yeah. Crypto and smart contracts, uh, the escrow concepts whereby there's release points. Yes, these things can help drastically because as soon as you know a service has been done, boom, it's been done action it here we go to, to an extent we've been doing this with with paypal to an extent yeah okay the the pay the money has been going into the person's paypal account but if you don't receive the service you can you can pull it back so we've been relying on these third parties yeah but maybe your but smart contracts maybe not be the panacea no it might be like your iban example mm -hmm. it might be well yeah it says in smart contracts i did that i'm still not paying you yeah, until well, they're, they're, they're next week um there how do you how do you penalize someone for breaking a smart contract. You're nodding your head. Oh, no, you can. You go, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't so, 
take, take the eBay concept, all right? If you want to be part of a marketplace and you haven't delivered a good and you said you delivered the good, the payment was passed on, you penalize by reputation. Sorry, this guy is not good enough to work with. So you can't penalize. Yeah, but, but I've, 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 I've never used that okay. as a last resort. I have a pretty good social media footprint, yeah. right? I, I, would, I would only use that at the totally last resort Going to, to, damage their, to damage their reputation. By no, the no, way... No, no, no. no, no I'm, I'm saying eBay itself, the, uh, like, a, like a, in this case, a third party, oh, I see. Where, the, where they would actually stop the transaction or stop the person from... Apologies, no yes. Okay, understood. On that. No, no, no. Going, going out to social media as a first resort is a horrible, a horrible idea. Yeah. It's, uh, it just makes you an evil person. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so listen, it's the time of year, it's the time of time. Um, optimist, optimist, optimist. Very much so. Pess optimist, cynical, jaded, old, <laughs> don't trust any motherfucker. <laughs> Give me some love for 2019, one by one, and then we'll, we'll close it up. 2019, we will see, I think we'll see an initial stable currency, which will be an under... This is the stable coin, yes. Yeah, a stable currency, which will be an underlying sort of price value, because with all these cryptocurrencies, they can fluctuate as much as they want. We need something to give our items value. An anchor. Services, an anchor pr price. Once we see an, uh, a, a, a widely accepted stable coin, which will be the value which we put things to, then we will see the cryptocurrency market explode. I agree. Sir? I think we will uh, see a lot of new businesses coming up uh, in this uh, financial banking sphere, and in 10 years' time, uh, the, the market leaders will not be the big banks. They won't exist. They won't exist, yeah. Do you see that? I mean, I think London's pretty cool for that. FinTech is booming in London. Uh, it's booming everywhere. I think transfer-wise, that's not Latvia, is it? That's uh, which one? Transfer-wise. Uh, Transfer-wise is Estonia and... Uh, Estonia and UK. Yes. Yeah. But in Latvia, there are lots of startups as well. And uh, what, 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 what form? Is it insure tech? Is it reg tech? You know, you can go anywhere. You know, you can, you can have a list of all the uh, services that banks usually do. You can uh, point a finger and you will see uh, like dozens of startups trying to get this part of the business. And you think Latvia is doing that more than Sweden or any other European country? I think Sweden is a good uh, example of uh, being at the forefront of what I, is being I settle, done. that's right. But uh, like if you compare us to, uh, I don't know, Southern Europe or uh, like Spain or France or, or, or somewhere like that, Italy, uh, we are uh, much more advanced. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Theo, last word's going to go to you, sir. For, for 2019, yes, please. Future, I think that um, something totally different, that uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and tokenization of art is going to continue to really explode. I think it's just started, and I think that's going to also be in a... We're going to see NFTs also... Could integrated. you explain NFT to the audience? It's a, it's a, it's, imagine issuing a token. There's only one token ever, and it's not divisible, so it's just a unit of one. So it's a one unique object. So imagine if you could integrate into a game here, for example, this digital unique object. There's only one of it ever. Wow. Yeah, and imagine if you could issue it yourself. So I could issue one of my own artwork, essentially issuing my own, own money. I think things like that are going to blow up. Uh, in eventually in 2019, and that maybe will lead one of be part of the next wave of people. Right. Okay. So we're ending. Checkbooks are over. <laughs> Whether it's the Soviet Union, that's official now. Uh, and NFT sounds like a very interesting and and I think overridingly uh, stablecoin is probably right as well. Excellent conversation. Thank you very much. A big sir. round of applause Thank you. for my panel. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Lessons from the payment card industry. The payment card industry data security standard has been around for years but there are always areas to improve. Let's focus on the common failing points. From non-compliance risks to merchant standards and customer rights and obligations. Trevor Arshak, Kite. 
Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Trevor Asha, director at Kite and uh, QSA for PCI. Um, the objective of this uh, very short presentation is to give you some feedback on the, uh, well, really comments and problems that we find whilst conducting some of these assessments that, that we do on a, on a daily basis. Um, OK, so, excuse me. Um, so first of all, the, uh, some facts about PCI. I know you, some of you are familiar with PCI, but PCI applies to anything that anyone that processes, stores, or transmits cardholder data. That might seem like something which is pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people ask us on a daily basis, oopsie, uh, on a daily basis, Am I in scope of PCI? Do I have to be PCI compliant? The answer is, if you do process store or transmit card or the data, then you are. And your suppliers and all your service providers that are involved in the process that you, uh, that you uh, take part are also in scope of PCI. Um, it's a standard, not a law. Uh, it is imposed and, excuse me, this is not really working very well. <laughs> um, it's a standard, not a law, but uh, it is imposed by the card brands down to the acquirers, down to the merchants and service providers. It requires validation on an uh, annual basis, and it has become uh, a requirement, really, for anyone wanting to do business in the payment industry, because your merchant service providers don't want to do um, business with someone that is not PCI compliant. So if I had to ask you very, a very quick uh, question, um, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about security? You'd probably say uh, hacking is an issue, it's an IT issue, not really, but um, it is a risk for my company if I'm not um, secure, which is probably true. Um, if I had to ask, on the other hand, if uh, what's the first thing you think about um, when we mention controls, as far as security is concerned? Um, you might say firewalls are typically something we'll, we'll have uh, to protect our network, username and passwords, and encryption for uh, storage of sensitive data, which is true as well. But why is it that we do not think of um, training, for example, uh, log monitoring, and policies? Um, they are also very important requirements, and you'd be surprised that out of all the PCI assessments that we do, uh, these three are the three most common failing points. Moving on to something, uh, just to set the, you know, um, put things into perspective. Um, statistics of breaches in 2017, so last year, of all the total breaches that were uh, reported, um, have been classified into three major um, root causes. Um, excuse me. 27% uh, have been human error, 25% uh, have been system glitches, and 48% have been uh, malicious attacks. So going back to my previous statement about why don't we focus on other controls rather than the most obvious ones, I would say these numbers could have been avoided. 27% of human error, oopsie. 27% of human error uh, could have possibly been lowered through training and through policies. System glitches could have been avoided probably um, through secure coding training and log monitoring. And the malicious and criminal attacks also could have possibly been reduced through uh, uh, proper log monitoring. So this other um, graph, uh, which is slightly um, more uh, worrying, to be honest. Uh, it shows the number of vulnerabilities that were detected through scanning on an annual basis in uh, last year. And as you can see, if it, yeah, if it shows, um, it shows the number of, of percentage of uh, vulnerabilities detected according to the age of when they first were discovered. And as you can see, last year, 25% have been uh, vulnerabilities older than 10 years. So with these statistics, why is it that people are still not patching the systems and preventing these sort of attacks? Okay, so to move on to something which is more relevant to the subject of the topic, these are probably my top um, five or six, well, seven, uh, reasons or problems that we find um, 
uh, are problems in conducting assessments and in uh, yeah, problems in achieving compliance. So missing scans, as you might be aware, there is an, uh, an obligation for running quarterly scans. Uh, it is a problem if these are not being carried out. Uh, because you can't obviously go back to uh, recover a scan uh, that has not been conducted. Um, no leg regular uh, log monitoring, as I mentioned before, there is an obligation for uh, logging all of your log of, of any logs that your devices generate need to be logged and need to be central, uh, central uh, collected. These are actually be, uh, done, but the monitoring of such logs are not, and it's um, just as bad as not having logs at all. Scoping uh, is another problem which uh, is probably should have been on the, on the top of the list. If you don't scope your PCI project prob uh, properly, you'll end up with uh, a failed assessment almost at the start. You know, there is absolutely no way how you can comply to a standard when not all of your systems, processes, or, or data that you process have been included in the scope. Um, as I said, uh, there's, um, uh, you know, secure coding practices have, uh, are not so common, despite knowing how serious um, bad programming uh, is towards preventing breaches, yet we keep seeing problems with this. Training sometimes is completely non-existent. Um, obviously, yeah, things like procedures and uh, and the documents matching those procedures are typically uh, absent as well. I know IT people don't really like uh, to, to document stuff, but it is um, very, very important, not just from a compliance perspective, but also from a... I'm sorry, I keep on going back. It's, it's timed, apparently. Um, but also from a compliance, uh, a compliance and security point of view. And finally, scheduling of tasks. There are so many, there are about 300 um, requirements in PCI. Some of them require um, uh, tasks to be scheduled, and they have to be carried out. And these are often um, forgotten. OK, so um, uh, going forward to discuss maybe what's happening in, um, in the next version of uh, uh, or, or with regards to development of the PCI standard, all of the requirements that have previously had forward-looking dates have now been, uh, are now mandatory or will become mandatory in the start of 2019. And uh, so we should, uh, you know, there's nothing, no, no optional requirements anymore. For any uh, issuers um, present over here, you would be uh, interested to know that the card production programs of the card brands are now moving to the PCI Council. So it is going to be um, possible to get you know, certified for your card production through your QSA under the PCI program. And the, the new version of PCI, which is in production, we're expecting um, new content with respect to uh, challenges um, through emerging technologies may, uh, mainly, which currently are only being addressed through guidelines. Okay, um, so uh, with respect to compliance, um, first of all, it is important to understand that achieving compliance is only providing you with a minimum set of requirements to say you are, you've achieved a certain level, but definitely not the ultimate goal. So you should focus on security rather than compliance. Compliance is important, obviously, but security should take precedence. Um, security should not be looked at as an IT problem, just like compliance is not a legal problem. Okay? Um, security definitely needs to be assigned to uh, a, a person, um, just like compliance is in your organization, but it needs to be given ownership. Make compliance business as usual, not uh, a last minute thing just before the auditor, like myself, uh, you know, come in and you see me once a year. Don't prepare your security and your compliance stuff um, for the day before, but on a regular basis. And make sure to allocate the necessary budget because compliance is actually a costly uh, exercise. Okay, the, that's all from my end. Uh, any questions, please feel free to come and see us on our boat. I'll be happy to have a chat. Thank you very much.
precious metals and digital safe havens. The gold standard came to an end when the US dollar was no longer pegged to it. Deflation became the norm for all currencies until Bitcoin, with its hard-coded limited supply, kicked in. Jimmy Zhao, ZBX. Patrick Kadlitz, BitBay Pay. Theo Goodman, Proof of Work Media. Moderated by Monty Munford, Forbes. A trip's over on stage yet again. Um, you're probably sick to the death of us because you want to get <laughs> some food. Um, I think you, if you've stayed here for long enough, um, you, you know these guys better than I know my sisters. Um, again, quickly, we'll start with you, Jimmy. Quick, uh, tell us who you are. Okay, uh, my name is Jimmy. I'm, I'm the co-founder of the, one of the cryptocurrency exchange here in Mal Malta, uh, ZBX. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Patrick from uh, BitBay Pay and B BitBay Exchange. Theo Goodman from Proof of Work Media Design and Strategy Studio. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, and I write for Forbes, Economist, the BBC. I've done two interviews and three panels, and I'm knackered. So we're going to try and get this done quite quickly. Well, it's an amazing conference and all that stuff. Jimmy, this is a strange subject. Precious metals, presumably gold, uh, and digital safe havens, which I presume means currencies, not countries. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the subject matter in hand? Uh, did, did we make a mistake leaving the gold standard? <laughs> well, I kind of... Uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting because the, uh, the first... Uh, ISTO or a secure token offering. I've heard of it. You know the country Liechtenstein. They are like yes. uh, they have a lot of gold reserve. So uh, these guys, uh, uh, I think it was it was a year ago. They present their solution, which is very interesting. It's like uh, because in 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 the gold uh, trading uh, uh, sphere, they have a problem when someone from Hong Kong buy the gold. They have to ship the gold from the mountain in Liechtenstein to the port. And then to Hong Kong port, it would cost like a million dollars. Just, just do it. Yeah. The security, everything. And what they realize, like, they need a better solution. Uh, what, what happens, like, the government actually initiated, and also the, the, the gold reserve, they put every piece of the gold, like this. Uh, the picture shows, like, you know, have this gold uh, uh, bricks uh, on chain. So that means, like, they create actually digital gold tokens representing wow. the, the metal. And if you want to trade, you just trade the, the tokens. Then the ownership between the, the, the token and the, the owner, of course, need to be verified. And also the token itself representing a certain amount of the uh, certain uh, gold. Also, there's a link between it. So I, wh that's what I'm always saying. Like, really, the, the, that's, if you talk about ISTO for next run of the blockchain, I think the asset-based security is the future. Right. Yeah, okay. I don't. I don't really believe the the shares and stuff. Like that's why I'm like, this is actually quite interesting. Too. So 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 we we were talking earlier. A couple of people on the panel were talking about stable coins. Yeah. Being the future of well for 2019. So we have gold, which is a sta stable metal. Yeah. I suppose. I mean, I I don't know the gold price. Um, it's had little relevance in my life really. I did once deal in silver. Uh, when I lived in the Sinai Desert in 1987 in a hut. So I used to go to the Kanakhalili silver market in Cairo and buy silver there and get someone to make it into jewellery. So it worked for me for about three months. Silver was a pretty decent thing in my life, you know what I mean? Um, and I understand the Liechtenstein um, strategy, I, supp I suppose. But when we talk about digital safe havens, would you consider that STO to be a safe haven? Or, uh, would you, or maybe the epitome of the state? Yeah, th th this is what I'm saying. Like these days, if you look at a stable coin, most of the stable coin are, are trying to pick, uh, pegging to US dollar and euros and try to make it stable. But if you look at the financial history, even the central government sometimes cannot keep their currency stable. <laughs> so it's not a really true stable coin, right? No, no. So, um, mm. so in order for, for you to create some true stable coin, I think the, another round is really looking to the asset and use the asset to back it up. So it might be more stable than just thinking about the government, actually, the, 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 the US bond or whatever can, can help you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
So, so Theo, I'll, I'll go back to, I suppose, I don't know if this is a trope or some form of disinformation, but I always thought that the, the Nazis started World War II because they had all the gold, mm. right? So they had the money to, 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 to expand. Is there, is there the kind of possibility that, that, that someone could hoard stable coins being a government? Uh, um, so I think that... So you, I'll tell you what, there, no, maybe, maybe for the audience. Yeah. The difference between a stable coin and different... Well, coins. a stable coin is just trying to represent the value of a fiat currency. So tether is... Tether, yes. Tether is like one tether is one dollar. Uh, Gemini dollar is the same, and so is the one released by the Winklevoss twins. So it's just trying to reflect that on a blockchain. So the thing is, um, first of all, a stable coin, and that there's different forms of stable coins as well. For example, there's make or die, so that's more of an algorithmic, um, uh, actually backed by Ethereum. So it's a little bit more, it's a collateralized stable coin essentially on, on a blockchain, whereas you have Tether, or that's a so I would call that an off-chain uh, stable coin. It's essentially like an IOU that Tether will pay that out eventually. Now, the thing is, uh, these stable coins, especially the off-chain ones, are only as stable as the companies releasing them because, in the end, they're the one giving you the IOU. So you have a different kind of risk you have to think about. Another thing, you asked if they could be used as a safe haven. There's definitely not. Um, for example, the Gemini one and the Winklevoss twin version, the smart contract has a function in which they can freeze addresses because, of course, they're a U.S. company, so they have to comply with some regulations. And Tether was also able to essentially blacklist some address after they had found a technical flaw that was taken advantage of. So these are definitely not sovereign money, these so-called stable coins. Maybe something like Make or Die, which is a decentralized version, is, but it's very, very not, uh, un, not user friendly at all. It's very nerdy kind of thing, but maybe we'll see something like that in the future too. But both have a place in the market depending on what you want to do. But Tether seems controversial. Well, it seems controversial. Uh, there's, you could go into conspiracy theories about why it's controversial. It's controversial because of what I said, is that it's only as stable as the company issuing it. And if the company issuing it has, is doing offshore banking and is jumping from one bank account to the other, well, then people get nervous. And, there's, and, there, and they are the, you know, the, the market leader of the stable coins. There's like millions and millions and millions. Maybe you've seen the joke of uh, this uh, one video with this guy and he has a phone, he goes, print 100 million tether, <laughs> pump price. You know, so that's the kind of meme going out, and people think that's really how it is. But it's not quite that simple. So imagine doing a stable coin that's not US-based, not European-based, essentially based in offshore uh, bank accounts, and it's kind of tricky to do that. And then you have an alternative now. You can do like Finkelvoss twin dollar or um, uh, Gemini circle dollar. Sorry, not Gemini, circle dollar. And they are totally US-based. And so the thing is, is that you can't... Um, Sorry, I'm talking so much. Is you can't uh, audit a stable coin. You can only attest it that there is. Right. So, so it's kind of people, but people are hung up on auditing because everyone is in crypto. They're like, I want to see, I want to see the balance. I want to see the balance. But you, you, you can't really do it because it's a bank. So yeah, it's kind of tricky. Patrick, so I mean, precious metals, right? I presume that they are precious because of their scarcity, right? They're, they're difficult to mine. There's a, a finite supply. But I think, wouldn't we go back to Bitcoin, that there's a finite supply of 21 million Bitcoins. So that would imply to me that, that Bitcoin could be a new gold standard based on its scarcity or its difficulty. Does that make sense? It makes sense because, uh, you know, the gold, you know, you know, the mining of the gold is, 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 still, is still going on, yeah? So uh, with the 20, 20 million uh, Bitcoins we have right now, 17, yeah. 17 uh, uh, millions. So uh, I think the the the, the, the reach uh, of the tw 20 million will be uh, make a, a Bitcoin to be stable at that point, yeah. Yeah, because all it will be more more valuable. Yeah. yeah. 
So I think uh, other other uh, coins uh, like altcoins is uh, I, I wouldn't uh, think of uh, like like uh, investment of like like uh, uh, gold. Yeah. Yeah. The way I see it as a digital haven, I still exist in fiat currency. I pay my mortgage. I pay my school fees in that way. Uh, until a recent disaster uh, and a, crypto, a crypto theft, which I keep talking about because it's breaking my heart. But I did see it as a digital safe, well, I saw it as a safe haven anyway, but I saw it over a long period of time, almost like my pension fund, you know. So the volatility of that type of thing doesn't really bother me so much because I'm in it for a long, long time. Yeah. I'm not. A, a speculator, you know, I'm not doing it because I want to make a thousand percent or anything. I want to put it somewhere, philosophically and politically maybe, I believe in decentralization. Um, so I, I, do, I do think that uh, cryptocurrencies are a safe haven, but only if you look at it in, in, in the long, long term. term. Do you agree with that, Jimmy? Uh, it depends on which cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. Yeah. it's uh, yeah, Bitcoin uh, is one of the most adopted cryptocurrency right now. Uh, probably has the, the the attribute, but uh, doesn't mean like all the other tokens gonna uh, has the value in the, in the future. It's more become centralized in, in a way. Is, is there a limit to something like Ethereum? Is it like is it the same as Bitcoin? I should I should know this. Uh, no, not really. I don't I don't think uh, Ethereum does not have a finite limit. Um, it, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, compared to Ethereum, more like I was using comparisons like, if it is a village, you need a lake. If it's a continent, you need ocean. No, so it, it 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 grows as 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 a usage and so on. So yeah. Um, then. So it's so almost like. So basically, in cryptocurrency world, I still think the the precious metal concept is the the the, the Bitcoin. As as. You do as, think. Yeah. People always fall back to this like you know. It's the way to show you how you, how 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 much your, your your wealth you have, right? So like. I wonder if there's a kind of peak gold, if, if there's nowhere else you can get gold. Yeah, that, 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 this is something I really want to have to, to see in the cryptocurrency states. Like people talk about secure token offering. What I really want to see is the asset-based security happening. So basically, the token really linked to a real value. Like it could be a precious metal, could be a could be a bottle of wine. Like this yeah. wine actually keep reserve the value o over over time. And um, if you look at the dollar itself, I mean uh, the inflation and like it doesn't really st it's not stable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One dollar doesn't mean the, the, the in real the value like you you have 30 years ago. No, I think it's, it's, isn't there the the burger index? Yeah. Where a hamburger costs so much yeah. at a certain place. I mean that's I mean that's a, almost a, a, a similar form of currency, right? You know, it's two dollars here, one dollar there, four dollars there. I mean, you can do that with drugs. I mean, the price of cocaine, <laughs> I believe, uh, <laughs> varies from country to country, you know. Yeah. It, I suppose it depends what, I mean, I've never invested in gold, but I know it's there, yeah. and I perceive it to be stable and a precious metal, but since we left the gold standard, it seems to have been slow chaos. Would you agree with that, Sia? Uh, I don't think it's been chaos. What it's allowed countries to do is to use massive amounts of leverage that was not possible on the gold standard. So that's also one reason we have nice things. Yeah. It's just a tool. It's just that, like other tools, like we talked about earlier, yeah, no, it can fund wars and do other things too. So it, I don't think that you know, you have to have a currency that's commodity backed. Right. It could have a place um, in, in some uses maybe, but I don't think that uh, we have to have that. I mean, in the end, um, the reason gold has value is uh, it's, it's essentially a meme. It's, it's people believe in gold. Of course, there's industrial use of gold and it's a physical object and it's rare, but in the end, uh, most of the value is just belief, and yeah, yeah. so is fiat. Yeah, I suppose you could say the same thing about, I don't know, I think probably the richest mineral, precious metal country on earth is probably DRC, Congo, right? That seems to continually come up with new mm -hmm. metals or new elements. I mean, cobalt, I think, is an example mm -hmm. of, I've got cobalt in my mobile phone, you know, the mining mm -hmm. of that. 
But you don't see reference points to the price of cobalt. Well, it hasn't caught on as a meme that everyone is agreeing that that has a value. But gold and silver are really easy to understand. There's yeah. jewelry. There's, where's the cobalt jewelry? Where yeah. is it? I don't Diamonds. see it. Yeah. Diamonds is a whole other topic, but yeah. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose you could even go down to rice, or the, something <laughs> like that. I mean, but I mean, I, th I think. Well, I mean, you I, could. Th you I could. sound really confused uh, because I am. You know what I mean? I don't. I I know what value is. I mean, you can have, I don't know, abstract concepts such as love or happiness or anything like well, that. Those are forms of currency of your life as well, right? Sure. Well, value is subjective, but then of course there is, you know, utility value and and things like that too. So it all comes together. Yeah. What do you think, Patrick? So you know, a, a, again, the uh, adoption, yeah, is, is uh, also key for, for 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 the, for example, bitcoins. Yeah, so I, I can really spend it, the money in in uh, different places. Uh, yeah, and you know, the the bit, uh, gold and the bitcoin is the, 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 the difference is that anyone can can buy it. Yeah. Uh, Do you think they're the same? Mm, I, I would I wouldn't mix those two those two yeah why if, not uh, you know if if I want to buy a, a gold uh, I probably uh, if we are here yeah everyone has a Bitcoin yeah uh, or at least uh, touch it and buy it yeah and I think also uh, we here uh, we're also uh, I I didn't buy uh, gold yeah so the adaptation on uh, in in the earth it will be probably the, the key, yeah, because anyone can, can uh, get to this, uh, you know. Well, you talk yeah. about scarcity. I mean, we might be thinking about water as a currency in the future. Do you know what I mean? Planets dying up. I, 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 I met someone very interesting the other day, and he said, uh, who do you think is the biggest fan, believer, in uh, cl uh, global warming? And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, the US military. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, they know what's coming. And they see a tropic around the world, like a 2% of the world, like Ukraine, fruit basket, bread basket of Europe. So their idea is that everyone will eventually migrate to these places. Mm -hmm. and that type of thing, the, the scarcity of life is going to be quite interesting. Where we move to, where we go to, it, it won't matter what we, what we use. We might just have to survive, you know what I mean? Mm. Anyway, happy days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we're coming out of time, so let's have some optimism. I mean, I think all of you are optimists. Uh, crypto, safe haven, yes or no, Jimmy? Uh, I, I believe, yeah, for Bitcoin, it's probably... Uh, it's like the basic perception of value, right? So, yeah. uh, if, uh, w so what is money? And it's uh, common, it's uh, consensus, right? Yeah. Like, you believe this, this dollar you take can go to shop, and the, 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 sh the owner of the, the shop agree with you. So once uh, the, the Bitcoin as a concept, a cryptocurrency concept, start, you know, grow, like, now right now it's like maybe 5% population even not understand what it's all about. Yeah. Let's sure. say it grow up to 15%. So I think the trend is unstoppable. So it's, I really believe the, if you hold, uh, it's... Uh, safe hold, and don't and sell. <laughs> With you, Patrick, your ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm believing that you know, crypto will be, is the is the key. Maybe not for uh, next next year, but m maybe two, three years. Yeah. It also evolve yeah, in different uh, sectors. Yeah, and also blockchain itself as the technology is something that uh, uh, we, we, we like internet like, like yeah, well maybe uh, in twenty 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 years, years ago. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I believe that it will be a huge hold, not yeah. sell. Uh, Moon. I would hold. Hold. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think as a if. Crypto is a digital safe haven, I would say yes, in the sense that it's not easy to confiscate. Um, you, it's, you know, it's much di more difficult for the government to take it from you or a thief to take it from you um, than, for example, if I have bars of gold. I have to put it under my bed or I have to trust a bank. Yeah. Um, and then that could be confiscated in an event 
Um, for, I mean, we maybe all, everyone can remember, you know, when Cyprus, you know, shut down the banks for a short period of time, and Absolutely. you probably couldn't get your gold then either if it was in a safety deposit box. Yeah. But if you had Bitcoin, then, you know, you could have used it. Now, as far as the price, I'm not going to make uh, any predictions about that. But I mean, as far as a safe haven of just holding value that's not able to be confiscated, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, I mean, I think, was it in India a couple of years ago, um, they banned the 500 rupee note yeah. just because there was so much. They're corruption. trying to do it to the euros too. They're, I yeah, think they're collecting the 500s also. You can't use a 50 pound note in London. No one will take it <laughs> because, because of the thing. But then that has very bad consequences because a yeah. lot of Indian women used to save money that the men would spend and, yeah. they'd hide them, and then that was all wiped out. The music's beginning. We've got 14 seconds overdue. Jimmy, thank you. Patrick, thank you. Theo, thank, thank you. Thank you for a great conversation, which is a very tricky, tricky subject to moderate. <laughs> and I'm now done. Thank you for making my job easier. <laughs> Round of applause for my panel, please. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Okay, guys, uh, thank you for uh, c coming here, sitting uh, with our, our uh, speakers. Uh, so I hope you joined the, the, the conference. Uh, so right now we finished uh, at this uh, at the, uh, the payments conference. Uh, next will be on uh, 2, 2, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, with the affi affi affiliate. So thank you very much for coming. Have a great show. Thank you.